Hey Thunder. Glad you haven't forgotten about good old Uwop. God for God forbid. Alright, looks like we're all set to go. Um So we had this problem posted to my Discord. Bob already responded to it. Just make sure I understand what's happening here for myself. Make sure I don't have anything to add. Um, so this person had to do had to determine the equations of two lines that pass through the point negative four, negative five, and are tangent to graph of y equals x squared plus one. You may round coefficients to two decimal places. All right. Let's see what they did. All right, well, that pink line visually isn't quite right, but I think this person has the right idea here. <laughs> um, See, so the important thing to use here is m equals y mi minus y1 and x mi over x minus x1. Uh, we're given the point negative 4, negative 5. We know the derivative is equal to the slope of the tangent, and if the derivative is 2x, that means 2x is equal to m. We also happen to know that y is equal to x squared plus 1, because we want to find the points on the parabola. So now you have an equation just in terms of x. So far I like what I'm seeing. Um, say combine like terms, or I guess they kind of consolidate things, but then they get ready to... Um, Basically cross multiply, which this multiply by one isn't necessary, but it doesn't hurt. Um see so yeah, this looks good. So two x times x plus four becomes two x squared plus eight x, good. Then x squared plus six. Okay, so yeah, here's a mistake that I think Bob po po pointed out, which is when they subtract over the x squared plus six. That 6 should have become negative. Um, easy mistake to make. So we should get x squared plus 8x minus 6. Which... Yeah, both these are actually factorable, so it's easy to get fooled with this one that you didn't m make a mistake. They use the... Uh... Wait. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I switched the 6 and the 8. Um, neither of them are factorable. Nothing multiplies the 6 and adds to 8. And the negative sign doesn't help you. Well, it is factorable. It's just... Uh, I guess you get these square roots. So if we if we have the proper quadratic, what, what do we expect for our factors? Okay, yeah, so we still get irrational numbers, but that's okay. Um, alright. And then they use a calculator to um, round things up to do to two decimals, like the uh, problem says you can do. Then they get the y coordinates for each x coordinate. Um, and it's good to plug it into the parabola, right? Um, they're getting the slope of the line. Yeah, that's fine to plug it into the derivative. I guess it should be a y prime equals 2x, but they're, they're, they they have the, the right idea here, just slightly off no, notation. They use this point slope form of line, which I do quite like for these problems. 
All right, so yeah, I agree with their, with their process. Um, so I don't have anything to add, to add beyond uh, Bob's note there. Oh, yeah, so that, <laughs> that green line looks almost decent. It doesn't seem to be quite touching, though. But the blue line is completely off, though, so... The green line might somehow intersect up above, too, or something. Okay, so I think we can just leave that one be. I think they just made that one error relatively early on that messed the rest of their work up. So let's, I guess, look around for questions on the internet. Amortization function. It has a 5% annual interest rate and it is compounded monthly. How many years will it take to double in value? So the interest rate is annual. It compounds monthly, which means yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, this formula kind of divides the interest rate for you. Um, so here, they don't tell you what your initial investment is. They just ask you in general how long will it take. So I would say that we take a sub t equals to 2 uh, a sub 0 and solve it for t. So we know what r and n are. So what do they do here? They plug in for everything except for A of T. Okay, yeah, so I think we, we know what we need to tell this, this person. Um, I'm sure I do agree with their setup otherwise. Yeah, okay. They're asking about um, how long it takes to double your initial investment. So, and our initial investment is a sub zero. So we can um, take a of t equal to two a sub zero. Since we don't know what our initial investment is, we could take a sub t equals to 2 times a sub 0, and then solve for t from there. A good first step would be dividing each side by a sub 0, and you'll find they cancel out completely so you don't have to worry about them. Okay, hopefully that's the uh, problem this person needs to carry through the rest of the problem. Integration of curves. Aquilaner got it. Carvocations. So with made up word. Coiner got it. Pinkton area. Coiner got it. <laughs> Classic homework help. Hey, vegans. Uh, I'm happy to take a look at it. I remember your problems being kind of hard, but I'll try to to figure it out. If you want to post it. Solve the equations for all values of A. Um, whatever's easier for you, vegans. 
you go ahead and type it out here or you can take a screenshot put it in the discord okay that works no i don't want Kiazo. for k greater than one so it's 15 factorial times 20 to the power of negative k over is that 19 minus k factorial is less than or equal to 0.5 oh both are 19 factorial okay and so i assume k is also less than or equal to 19. Okay. Um, it's between 1 and 19. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, still seems difficult to solve. <laughs> Trying to think of how we can do this. So, <sighs> hmm. what question am I going to ask? <laughs> is it to prove that this inequality is true? Is that the task here? We're looking for the lowest k possible. My inclination is just to guess and check. <laughs> Actually, no, 19 factorial is a little bit too hard to... Well... Okay. Well, let's go to the board and see how hard this actually is. You did the same? Yeah, I... You, you, you get a pretty nice cancellation, so it might not be that, that bad. And we have uh, one, I don't know if those are equal to k, or just strictly. One, it still if you plug into the formula at least, but I guess either way, we can just try one and see what happens. Yeah, I doubt they want you to plug in zero. Well, it's clearly not true for zero in, in, anyway. Is it? I don't know. I shouldn't do math in my head. Uh, Alright, so let's try k equals 1 and just see what happens. Get 19 factorial times 20 to the negative 1 over 18 factorial. Um, which comes out to be 19 over 20, which is certainly greater than a half. Alright. Let's try k equals 2. Yeah, this feels like an exercise that's just trying to get you used to working with factorials. Because <laughs> it doesn't really... I, the numbers are small enough that guessing and checking is pretty valid to me here. Um, 19 times 18 over 20 times 20. I gotta think that's greater than a half. Eyeballing it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so 19 factorial, 20 to the negative 3 over 
16 factorial. 19 times 17 times 16 over 20 cubed. Now it's getting a little bit harder to actually compute. Um, I forgot 18. You can get some cancellations, but... Well... I gotta think, that's also... Well, when is this... You, you said it's probably... You think it turns at k equals 5. I guess let's see. So basically what's happening is we have we have like a, a, a product. K equals one, you know, let's just or I guess we'll say I equals one to K. I don't know if this will help us analyze it. Of um nineteen factorial times 20 to the minus, well, it's like we have 19 over 20, we multiply that same 19 over 20 by 18 over 20, we multiply that whole thing by 17 over 20, and I'm trying to figure out if there's some kind of comment that we can make about that of product. I'm having trouble expressing it like kind of generally, but <laughs> I I don't know if products have as clean of like ways to analyze them as sums do. I, I I'm not very familiar. I haven't like worked with them that much. But you have this kind of interesting like recursion happening where you just multiply everything onto your last thing. Um, hmm. Trying to figure out if there's like a, a nice way to estimate this. So I, I'm kind of assuming we're not allowed to use a calculator here. We get spicy and try to kind of like cancel things out. It's so like uh, we can take a 2 out of that 18 and make it 9. We can take... 8 does go into 200. Does 16 go into 200? No. Well, we can take an 8 and a 2. The 16 can cancel out completely, I think, because then an 8 and a 2. That 19 goes with that 20. Uh, that 18 became a 9, so we took a 2 out of it, so times 10, times 20. So if we take an 8 out of the 16, wait, it, it doesn't go into 20, 8 goes into 40. So actually we can take away 2, take a 2 out of the 20. Like that. I shouldn't do this much cancellation in my head, I think. <laughs> I don't think that's quite right. But of course, the problem comes from from stochastics. Okay. Yeah, you, you, and it's it, it. Oh wait, I'm sorry. That, that, that's math professor. You're. Uh, it's the same co color that 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 Yanis uses. If you have an idea on this one, like, I'm definitely happy to hear it. Because um, if you didn't see this, the task was to find the smallest k that this works. And if we're not using the calculator, it's a little bit tricky to write. I'm having tr tr trouble getting an estimation of uh, what's greater than what. I know this cancellation is actually going to help, but let me try writing out and showing my work a bit more. 
so 9, 10, 2. I'm taking, oh wait, so 8 doesn't go into 20, 8 goes into 40. So if I take a 4 out instead, that's the, the key here. Take a 4 out, that becomes 5, and then I'm going to uh, cancel this 4 with that 20. There we go. So does 19 times 9 times 17 over 20 times 10 times 25 mean anything to, to us? It doesn't mean that much to, to me. Does it calculate at some point? Oh, okay. oh, it's the same as 19. Oh, you're right about that. Hey, Yanis. Yeah, so if you can use the calculator, that makes this task a lot simpler. Um, because the values of k, like the thing is simple enough that you really can just guess and check. So, math professor might be onto something with the whole realizing it's equal to perme the formula for permutation. I wonder if there's some kind of realization that we can make there. Hmm. But 20 to the negative k I feel like is going to mess up a lot of the things that we could say. Like, at, at, at what point do, um... Is, is there some nice way of thinking about per permutations with when they become half of their value? Uh, now the, the, the twenty to, to, to negative k kind of messes this whole thing up for for me at least. Let's just verify what the right answer is. So let's try nineteen factorial times twenty to the negative. Let's just try out four for ourselves. Uh, over fifteen factorial. So that's just above a half. So we're not there yet. So let's do k equals five. That's just below a half. Okay, so yeah, vegans, I agree with your answer of k equals 5 is the minimum that works. It's actually, it's like both types of permutation, right? Because a number to a power can be thought of as a permutation with repetition. So you're, you're really dividing permutation without repetition by permutation with rep repetition. And when does... When is the permutations without repetition, or sorry, with, with re repetition twice as big as without? Yeah, it, it feels like there's um. I feel like there should be some kind of interpretation. Like, there should be some kind of um, nice way of interpreting this. 
I guess it's not the it's not the exact same permutation because one of them is nineteen. The other one is twenty. So like maybe, I feel like there's a stack exchange thread. Like someone has still done this before. Oh, we have Martin Oscar Pavan over on YouTube asking about permutations also. <laughs> hey, Eldritch. Uh, well, welcome. Actually, that's Mar Martin, isn't it? I just see the accent over the eye now. In how many different ways can five different Martians sit? around a round table and eight different Jupiterians if no pair of Martians should be together. <laughs> um, oh, is this, so is this debating, is vegans doing like the, th the th theoretical version of this problem where you have repeats? Uh, just let me see if I can get to the bottom of this other qu question I was working on before, Mart Martin, and I think I should be able to do that question. I don't know if I'm going to get to the bottom of this question, so I might, uh... <laughs> mm, yeah, these aren't the exact thing that I was hoping to see. Yeah, so I'm not sure vegans. Um, if there's a better way to do it than guessing and checking. I think I'm going to try out Martine's problem here. So I'm not sure I'm going to think of anything new for that. Um... Yeah, I, I, I do think there's some kind of deeper interpretation that we can get out of that problem. I, I'm just not good enough with uh, combinatorics to realize it, I guess. <laughs> or I guess counting is a better word to use for it. How many ways can five different Martians sit around a round table and eight different Jupiterians if no pair of Martians should be together? It's very similar to the one you just saw. Yeah, I, I it seems to be... Um, the the general version of like this situation. Um, I don't know if this exact thread is going to have the information that we need though. Okay, so it's been a minute. Since I've done a problem like this, Martine, um, so let's see if we can figure this out together. Um, because these types of problems aren't really my my specialty. I usually can work them out. But uh, I might make a mistake on the first time around or be unsure of how to deal with, with, with something.
Okay. Ah, so we have five Martians and eight Jupiterians. And Martians don't like to sit together. So I guess we would we have a table of 13 seats. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay. So What I'm think, I, 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 I guess how I'm thinking to work through this problem. Let's just like, uh, arbitrarily say this is the first seat, and then like, we'll, we'll, we'll think about things like around in, in this order. I don't seem that important. Actually, that's it. Doesn't matter. For our first, I, I said how I'm thinking to do this is like for our first seat, we have thirteen options. We can seat anyone at that table and then that's going to determine who we can do next or who we can sit there next so actually how do we deal with like the different branches because now if that's a jupiterian we can sit anyone else there but if it's a martian we can't sit anyone else there So I think let's just get one valid combination, maybe, and try to extend it out to figure out what all our other ones. So I assume we would count rotations as the same thing. So just say we have a Jupiterian. Well, let's um, alternate until we, we run out of Martians. Uh, I feel like there's like a more math way to solve this directly, but this isn't like my, my strong suit so i'm trying to figure out the logic for myself i guess <laughs> that's our last martian one two three four five so we can just do the rest as jupiterians good so that's one right there and would we consider rotations to be the same i'm not really sure I guess we'd have, you could consider it, if you do want to consider rotations as separate, we could say that there's 13 versions of this, including that. Oh, who got first? Jed, nice. So yeah, including this one, I guess there'd be 13 versions of this because there's 13 seats, and so you could rotate them around 12 times if you include your initial one. That's 13, I think. <laughs> I hope I'm analyzing this right. And then we can switch like these two and get another valid combination. So maybe that's the logic that we use. And that has another 13 rotations. So we have another 13. Let me actually kill this. Uh, so we could have J and M. Then we can keep on shifting that Martian through. 36 minutes in. You guys are sleeping? Apparently, yeah. You have five M's with gaps that must have one plus J's in each gap. You did that, but that happens to you and you don't know how to continue. Yeah, that's fair, Mar Mar Martin. Oh, that's an interesting thought, Jed, as a quicker way to generalize this. How would that work?
Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Martin, I, I do stream the Twitch in, in, in YouTube. So, uh, uh, when I'm talking to Jedi, uh, Jedi's over in the Twitch chat in case you're confused. Uh, Jed is suggesting a different approach. I, I think this approach would become the same thing, but I kind of like Jed's approach. It might be a bit easier to, to visualize things. So let's draw instead. Let's just place our Martians because we know they have to, they're kind of the more strict ones. So let's deal, let's just make five slots for the Martians. The Jupiterians can kind of go wherever we need them. Okay, so there's our five Martians, and we're going to say after each one, we need at least one Jupiterian. So that takes up five of our Jupiterians. Now the other six... Wait. Sorry, three. We have eight, 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 eight Jupiterians. <laughs> Can kind of go wherever they want. Um, so you could have all three of them just go on the end here. And the same will be true here, 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 and here. I think we... I, I hope there's a better way to do this than just manually counting. I don't know if there is a more, like, automatic way to do it, though. Um... But we, we have at least boiled down the problem to just these ex these last three Jupiterians, which I think is a nice thing to, to do. So if we keep all three of these together, there's one, two, three, four, five different places for them to be. So maybe let's just start um, ma manually counting cases here. Five, and then let's say we split one off and put them like, you know, there. Um, one is split off. The two have five options to go. And the one has then four options to go, so it'd be five times four. This isn't actually that bad now, I think. Um, and if two are split off... So if they're all individuals now... Just say like that and that. Uh, the first one has five options for places to go. The second one has four options for places to go. The third one has three options for places to go. And I think that covers all our cases. So what does this become? Uh, 60 plus 20 is 80 plus 5 is 85. And if you wanted to, I don't actually, and now I've, I, I think the more I think about it, the more I think rotations should be the same thing. If rotations were different, you would multiply that by 13, I think, or even 12. That's the part of, that's the part of counting that, like, I'm, I'm really not, not sure about, but I think 85 is our number. We, we might want to multiply it by something to, to count for rotations. I think that's maybe the easiest technique, though. The rotation matter of the last case would be much harder. Um, what up? 
Maybe I'm un un underthinking it. Can I do five MS and oh, five Martians and five Jupiterians and then switch with the rest of the Jupiterians? Or that isn't possible. Um, I shoot, I didn't see exactly when you said that, Martine. That might, if that's what I was, if that's what I just did on the board, I think that's fine from the way that I did it. If you're saying something else, I'm not sure how to interpret it. Or I'm not sure what you're talking about. I might actually Google this problem too, to see if we can get a similar one. Hey, SPQ. Well, that's kind of what I just did. I was being a little bit lazy with my, like, underscores, Jed, but I think it's what's on the board right now, right? I'm seeing one site that's saying it's 176,400. That seems a little high. What? Wait, is this the same problem before we, we get too deep? Five distinct Martians and eight distinct Jovians. BC to a circuit table. If you know two Martians. Okay, this is the same problem. Oh, R Rolando, thanks uh, so much for getting back to me. I, I, I really appreciate that um, hearing that my explanation helped. Um, thank you. Charles Spelling Executive Gaps, that will be counted five times. SPQ, whether it's include rotations or not, I'm not sure of. <laughs> I'm thinking not, if it's a round table, but this is the entire like context I have for, for the problem. The eight Jovians can be seated in eight minus one factorial equals seven factorial. Why? Oh, you do need to. Okay, that's right. They are distinct, I guess. So you need to account for <laughs> different. Well. Hmm. This is hard to interpret. I, I I think it gets so big because they're counting the same arrangement multiple times for the uh, Jupiterians and Martians being different people, different a aliens anyway. <laughs> so like, I guess it's five factorial ways to do the five Martians rather than just five ways. But I, I don't know if that's the same problem that Mart Martin is doing. Martin, you said TY. Uh, I don't know if we... <laughs> I, I, I don't have a confident answer for you. If you, if you got what you needed from the pr for problem, then great. Or from me at least thinking about it, then great. But I, I'm not that confident of the answer that, of 85 that I said. Wow, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't get this. The answer does not look correct. All right. Um, it is just a random thing that I saw off Google. So the answer that I got is 85, but that's counting all Martians the same and, and all Jupiterians as the same, and it's not counting rotations. Which... I don't know if that's proper or not. <laughs> and ignore the top part of the whiteboard that was my first approach or my first attempt hey ckk the ckk i went to hawaii pacific university
Oh. That seems like a nice way of breaking him down. <laughs> so you have eight options and you take five of them. Does that eight choose five? Or seven. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine options there. Nine choose five. Huh. This seems like a nice way of doing it. What is nine choose five? Nine C five times eight factorial times five factorial. I'll, not degrees. Um, <laughs> can you say choose nine comma five? That is a big number right there. Um, they're doing a line, not a circle. With a circle, you need eight choose five, not nine choose five. Oh yeah, because the beginning. It's the same as the end in a circle. Oh, this is wait in line. That's a good point zone. So yeah, and our problem is around a circular table. Um, if it's times 10 to the 8th, that's... Is that 200 million? 7 factorial... Eight choose five. Oh yeah, you have to. Well, they factor us for eight distinct jo Jovians, Jupiterians, whatever. I'm not sure why it's seven or seven factorial instead. Is it because the first one doesn't matter? But then why would the first Martian not matter? Thirty-three million. Oh, Wolf and Rampa writes it out for you. That's nice. It's a lot. Hmm. No CKK. <laughs> In fact, combinatorics problems, I, I I'm not very good at. <laughs> uh. I, I would say much more in my lane is like algebra and pre-calc and calculus. Those like types of math. So I um I am assuming I'm gonna look at a kind of combinatorics problem because uh Martin over on YouTube is asking about one. But these are definitely not the problems that I'm best with. So Jason a circle, seven factorial ways to do this. There's seven factorial ways to put the J's in a circle. Oh, you take one off because of it being a circle too? Interesting. Okay, that's pretty, that's convincing to, to me, Zone Ranger. Thank you for, for saying that. <laughs> uh, Martina, if you are still here, uh, what's on screen is the answer, and I definitely trust Zone's word over mine here. Uh, and I'll copy paste the rationale over to the YouTube chat. Actually, I'll, I'll post the Sack Exchange link as well, but the Sack Exchange link does it in a line and not in a circle. And so what I'm pasting over from Zone is the rationale for how you adjust it.
Oh shoot. YouTube's char character limit is very low for chat. Okay. Uh, let's give out some saves. So, Zone Ranger definitely had a save there. A save for SPQ for helping out. And a save for Jed for the initial approach there. Okay. So yeah, uh, thanks for the problem, Martin Routine. Sorry I can't answer it more authoritatively, but... <laughs> Thankfully, with being a math streamer, there's people in chat who often know the answer. Doing differential calculus right now, would you be able to help me find the domain of a function? Um, I think so, Lucas. Also, hi, Lucas. Now, when you say differential calculus, I assume you're in like the first semester of a calculus class rather than differential geometry, which I haven't taken. Um, if you want to post your question, please do. Um, you can type it out there in chat, or if it's easier to put a screenshot, I have a Discord server where, where you can do that. Um, I'm not going to look at that yet. Well, I'm, I probably won't, won't have to look at it if we keep getting questions from chat. Um, sounds good, Lucas. In the meantime, I'm going to erase my whiteboard. I really need to rotate my whiteboard like someone suggested a, a week or two ago. It's because, like, this section of the whiteboard is definitely showing some battle scars now. <laughs> The green one that seems to not erase. Like I, I can see a permanent like green hue on the board now. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Um, I haven't made like a weird noise. I didn't know what to think about it, but I'm just gonna sound like it didn't happen, I guess. Okay, so in the meantime, once Lucas posts their problem, I'll switch over. But in the meantime, I did have this one open from before. Am I right? Is it the proper method? Solve the equation for all values of a. Oh, there's a question. Find the domain of a function where f of x is equal to 2x cubed minus 5x squared plus 7x minus 3. So... Oh, that's not how you do that command. One second. There you go. Uh, Lucas, I would say that when you get asked to find the domain of a function, you have to look for values of x that would somehow break the function. So doing things like dividing by 0, uh, doing the square root of a negative number, um, 
taking the log of a negative number or of zero. Those are things that can like break a function. But here we just have a cubic polynomial, and those are nice. Uh, there's nothing. There's no value of x we can plug into that that can possibly break it. Um, so for the answer, the notation can depend on the class. Um, I'll show you on the board a few different ways to note it, I guess. <laughs> so, if we have, um, x equals the, uh, 2x cubed plus 5x squared plus 7x minus 3. So here, I can't name a single value of x that would cause an issue with this function. So we'd say that you can plug any real number in for x. So I, I'll list a few ways that you could say that, and you should use the one that you, you see in class. <laughs> so I don't use this one, but you could say x belongs to all real numbers. That's what uh, this means. Uh, probably the ways that I'd expect to see it done in a class is... Um, with interval no notation, and at least in America, we would say this function goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, and we use parentheses to show that it's not inclusive because you, infinity is a number, so you don't like include it. If you're not in America, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly what countries do and don't do this different notation, but other countries do square brackets facing outwards to mean it's not included. Um, and I guess that's kind of all the ways that you would note it. Like, I'm, I'm thinking, like, you could maybe... <laughs> this looks kind of goofy. I don't think this is proper. But usually with intervals that aren't like this, you can make them into inequalities. But they, they, they look kind of goofy when they're both infinity. <laughs> if you had the interval, like, 3 comma positive infinity, you could write as like x is greater than or equal to three, so that looks a lot like cleaner. But I I, I don't know if I'm a huge fan of that, so I'm assuming that you are probably going to want one of those notations. Uh, that just looks so stupid. The 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 inequality version, yeah, it does. Yeah, and I don't think I've ever written that before, to be honest. <laughs> Oh wait, this looks dumb? To me, that, that one looks natural. That's, that's what I'm used to, though. Inequality was not much better. <laughs> Dusk Winner over on YouTube says, What up, Don? I'm struggling with this one question with for trig identities. All right, I'll, I'll take a look at that in a second, Dusk. Lucas, let me know if you have any questions on this. If not, I'm going to erase what's on the board and move on to Dusk's thing. So that's how, that's how you would... Wait, you don't like this one? Wait, I, I, I swear that's how they do it in like um, a lot of European countries, the backwards brackets. Be denied entry into the new California Republic? Wait, so like... Yanis, are you used to using like the, the parentheses or like... I swear this was... um. Like, these notations are equivalent. I, I, I don't know how things are done outside of uh, America, though. I've just, I, I've seen that, that backwards bracket notation. More of a school thing that no uni does. Oh, okay. I assume that if you're in higher level math, you probably just say x belongs to real numbers. That's where you live. That's fair enough. Okay, so I don't see anything else from Lucas, so I'm going to race what's on the board here and move on to um, Dusk Winner's problem. Uh, I think I see the trick with yours, Dusk Winner. Um, and I assume the task is to prove this identity. Uh, 
Um, I can, Lucas says, yeah, I can't find questions in the practice test, but our teachers have said it will be in the test. Do you think you could give me an example that could be hurt or solved? Sure, Lucas. Um, let me work out Duff's problem first, and then I'll come back to you. SG1, it might be an easy question for you. It's not easy for everyone, though. So I'd appreciate if you didn't just straight up call people's questions easy. Because <laughs> that's kind of discouraging to someone who's just learning it for, for the first time. Um, cosine squared. Yeah, R and for intervals, you use that same notation that we do. Okay, I wonder what countries do use that other no notation then. So this is our problem here, desk winner. Okay. Wait, really? How is this going to work? Oh, maybe I see. Okay, so... If we're trying to prove this identity, we we can only work on one side of the equal sign, and the right side is more complicated, so let's work with the right side. It gives us a bit more um, room to work with. So I see that we have the squared outside the parentheses. Using exponent rules, we can distribute the squared to each uh, factor here. So let's do that. Okay. Doesn't, isn't this going to cancel? Let me look at my sheet of trig identities. I, I, what's the one involving uh, cotangent? 1 plus cotangent squared is cosecant. And that's what we want. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> Never mind, this is good. And so now I see we have cosine squared and cosine squared. So let's factor that out. And um, this is where I got to my head, and then I, I mentally got stuck for, for a second. If you know the Pythagorean identities, this is one right here. Uh, the formula sheet that I use expresses it as cotangent squared x. Oh, wait, never mind. It's uh, cosecant squared x minus cotangent squared x equals 1. We can rearrange this to add cotangent squared to the other side. And then we uh, have our situation over here in the problem. So right here, 1 plus cotangent squared, 1 plus cotangent squared. Let's make that a cosecant squared. So we get cosine squared x times cosecant squared. Cosecant is 1 over sine, so let's make that substitution. And um, I even write up the extra step of putting cosine squared over sine squared. And cotangent is just cosine over sine, as it turns out. So this is cotangent squared. Um, so we end up with cotangent squared equals cotangent squared, and we've proved the identity now. That's why I'd say that you'd do that problem. Um, let me know if you have any questions. If not, I'm going to try and invent a better question for Lucas uh, to find the domain of. Awesome, Dusk. Glad to, uh, to help. Do you know any confident number theory that transforms number theory functions into analytic functions? I can't say I do. <laughs> um, I'm, I, 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 number theory is not my strong suit, so. I'm, not, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. All right, so Lucas, if you are still here, let me start off with a simpler case, and we can try and build on it. Just I'm not sure exactly how comfortable you, you are with this. If you have um, f of x equals the square root of 1 minus x, do you have any ideas for how to get the domain of this function? Oh, 
What do you have in mind? Oh, I assume that's directed towards CKK, Yanis. Are you still here, Lucas? You're doing research about it, just wondering. You are here? Okay. So, do you... So I'm happy to just show you how to figure out the domain of the function I wrote on the board, but do you have any ideas first that you, you, you want to say before I try it? Go for it? Okay. So, when you look at square rooting, so the only kind of thing that's potentially an issue here is the square root. And so just as like a demonstration, uh, let's see where square roots do and don't work. So if you square root a positive number, let's say four, that's completely valid, you get two. So square roots of a positive number are fine, even if you have like not a perfect square, like three, it's equal to something, but we know it exists. So positive numbers are good. Square root of zero is good. But the square root of a negative number uh, is not good, at least in this context. We don't want to get imaginary numbers involved. So <laughs> we'd say that any negative number you can name is not a valid thing for x in this context. Um, and that's how we kind of want to break down the problem in thinking about um, what do we like what kind of numbers do we want underneath the square root so we're okay with zero we're okay with anything greater than zero so what we do is we take the inside of the square root here and we set it to be greater than or equal to zero so and then we just solve it so 1 minus x is greater than or equal to zero um, so we can subtract the one to the other side. So we get negative x is greater than or equal to negative one. Now we multiply each side by negative one and with inequalities, that means you have to flip it. So we get x is less than or equal to positive one. Um, and that's our answer for the domain. Again, it may also be written uh, in interval form with negative infinity to positive one, inclusive. Or it could just be that inequality there. These are both like valid answers in classes that I've seen. And if you're ever not sure, it's good to try plugging random numbers for x in your interval in here and testing them out. So if we plug in 1 exactly, we get 1 minus 1 is 0. Square root of 0, we know is good. If we plug in 0, we get 1 minus 0 is 1. Square root of 1 is good. If you plug in a negative number, let's say like negative 10, because that's also less than, less than or equal to 1. You get 1 minus negative 10 is 11. The square root of 11 is fine. So are, are, are you okay with that one, Lucas? Okay, critical thinking. Um, I'm going to do a few more problems uh, like this with Lucas. Maybe take like five minutes or so. Um... If you, want to look up, uh, if you have a problem, go, go ahead and post it, because I don't have anyone else asking. So do you want to see another one now, Lucas? Or do you feel like you're okay? Or uh, how, how are you feeling? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, gold. <laughs> Feeling good. Glad to hear it. One more would be nice? Sure. Range 2. Uh, Lucas is only asking about domain, but... Um, if you want to ask about range 2, Lucas, just let me know. So... I'll give you a bit of a harder one if you just want to see one more. Uh, how should we do this? I'll, I'll take two examples that we didn't go over yet and mash them together. So let's say our function is 3 times ln of 1 over x plus 4. Why not? So I hope that you're familiar with ln. It's also log base e. Um, domain range is cool. Maybe show the quadratics or things that have discontinuities. Oh, yeah, piecewise functions would be a good thing to cover too. Yeah, we started with the cubic, which I guess is, I, I guess with range, it's a good thing to show. Uh, the Lucas over on YouTube was only asking about domains so far, but that's a good point. Like the cubic versus quadratic would be a nice, like, example of differences. Ooh. Uh, CKK, thanks for, for, for the follow. It's one of the alerts that I just put in two days ago. All right, so if we just want the domain of this one, Lucas, um, we kind of have two separate things going on here. So we have to look, like, we have potential problems with dividing by zero if x plus four is ever uh, z zero. We also have potential problems with the ln because you can't take logs of zero or a negative number. So we have two separate kind of potential issues we have to worry about at the same time. And I'll show you how we deal with that. So um, just from this piece here, we uh, don't divide by zero. And then from this log piece here, we don't take log of negative or zero. So we need, we need to work out what each of these restrictions cause for us. Um, and take the most strict version of those. So let's work from the inside out, I think. It doesn't really matter which way you do it, but I just tend to do the inside out. So let's uh, work on not dividing by zero first. So looking just at the 1 over x plus 4 piece, um, if we want to make sure we're not dividing by zero here, well, we really only care about the x plus 4 and when it's not equal to zero. Actually, I guess it's probably better to set it equal to zero, so it's a bit more familiar. <laughs> So let's look at where x plus 4 does equal 0 and know that we have to exclude that. So this is just, you know, solve this for x, so subtract 4 from each side. You get x equals negative 4, so that means there's one spot, negative 4, that we definitely can never pl plug in here. Um, so we have one restriction here that x is not equal to negative 4. Now let's look at the ln part. We still need to worry about the uh, fraction being inside too. So we can't take log of 0 or a negative number. It's just not defined. Um, let's go and get into complex numbers again, which makes it, which isn't the point. <laughs> All right, I see your question cr cr critical. Thanks for posting it. Um, so we need whatever is inside the log here to be strictly greater than zero. And if you wanted, we could do that same like analysis with like a general like log, like ln of two, it's fine, it's a number. ln of one, it's fine, it's just, it's actually zero, which is fine ln of 0, not good. ln of negative 1, not good. 
Um, so unlike a square root, like square roots are okay with zero, logs are not. So that's kind of like the difference between them. Um, How do you solve this one algebraically? <laughs> I can just see that we want it to be a positive number. Oh, okay, so... Wait, I... We want x... x is going to end up being... greater than negative 4? I... I... It's actually a little bit of a weird situation with the inequality. I'm trying to make sure that I deal with it in the right way. So you can flip each side. Uh, actually, no, you can't flip each side. I don't know if there's a good algebraic way to solve this, so maybe I'll just solve it the intuitive way. This actually, it's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> this is a fraction. It's never going to be exactly equal to zero because we don't have zero on top, and zero on the bottom would break things. So we can actually separate this out into two different problems. The top is always positive, like one is always greater than zero, so we don't have that many cases to worry about. We just need to ensure that x plus four is greater than zero also, because if x plus four is negative, then positive over a negative is negative, and a negative is less than zero. Um, so we want either both the top and the bottom to be or we want the top and bottom to either both be positive or both be, be negative for the entire fraction to be positive. And if, since one is always positive, we just need this to always be positive. So x plus 4 is positive. Uh, we can subtract the 4 to, to the other side. We get x is greater than negative 4. So actually, this is kind of a lame one where our conditions kind of agree with each other. Um, so, okay, like... Oh, one over zero, but yeah, exactly. Gold. That's what I was like. Ugh. <laughs> so I think it's the way that you would have to to, to, to do it. It's a little weird situation because I'm making these examples up off, off the top of my head. So I hope I'm not confusing you too much here, Lu Lucas. But um, we have to look at both our, our both the conditions we've set now, and make sure they're all all always true. But here they kind of agree with each other. Um, x is strictly greater than negative four. And x is not equal to negative 4. Um, I, we would take this one because it's stricter. Per, per, pretty much this only allows greater than negative 4, whereas this is anything except for negative 4. So we'd say that our domain here is x is greater than negative 4. Because this allows for like negative 5, negative 6, like um, numbers that are okay with the division there, but not okay with the ln. Um, so we'd say that the entire domain of function is x is greater than negative 4, or, or if you're supposed to use intervals, I would write it like uh, that. Um, you could have a different situation that I was hoping to engineer, but I didn't, obviously. Like, let's just say you have some other function where you, you get your conditions like x is not equal to 2, but x is also greater than ne ne negative 4. Now you have to deal with both of these at the same time. So we would say that um, negative 4 is less than x is less than 2, or x is greater than 2. So like these are both true at the same time. It could be between negative 4 and 2, or greater than 2, but not 2 exactly. Or an interval notation. There's a few ways it could be written, I guess. Uh, negative 4, comma 2, union to infinity. You sometimes get some weirder things like this is the point that I'm trying to, to make when you have multiple restrictions. So I hope that I was uh, mostly makes sense to you, Lucas. I could have probably engineered a better uh, example, but <laughs> I hope I've conveyed the idea of how you, you want to look for things. Hey, Frederick. Yeah, welcome back. I do have a question from Critical Thinking to get to. But Lucas, uh, please let me know if you that makes sense. It does help. Okay, awesome. 
once I get, and if you do s stick around, once I get through crit crit critical question, I'm happy to, to come back to you. I'm just trying to budget my, my time a bit and help everyone out. All right. Please do five plus twelve. I'm having trouble. Hey, KJ does stuff. Uh, sure. Uh, I'll I'll do that before I get to criticals. Because this will just be a regular addition. So if you have five plus twelve. Uh, if you're just like doing your arithmetic secure for the first time, I, I I would set it up like this with the the bigger number on top. Um, as twelve plus five down here, and now you get to go down each column and do the addition individually. Two plus five is seven, and then one plus there's an invisible zero here is one. So I'd say that twelve plus five is seventeen. I hope that makes sense. Um, critical, are you here? No worries, KJ. I'm going to throw it into anything else. You are here? Okay. Thanks for hanging on. So we want arc length with polar coordinates. Let me look at the formula. There we go. All right, this is what we need. So we're just going to plug into, I mean, this formula and this formula. OK. So we have L equals the integral A to B of root R squared plus BR B theta squared D theta. And the interval they gave us is 0 to 2 pi. I can look at that in a minute, SG1. I'm not sure exactly how, how you do that with the double absolute values. I think I, I, think I can figure it out, actually. Just need to, to graph it. Oh, or you retracted it? No worries. All right, so let's plug into the formula. Well, actually, before I plug in the formula, we need to figure out what dr by d theta is, so let's do that. If we take this and we do d by d theta of each side, we get dr d theta equals 2 theta. All right, so now we know what dr by d theta is. Let's plug it in. Um, they give us the integral for us, which is nice. So we go from 0 to 2 pi. We get square root r squared. So r is just theta squared, so we're going to theta to the fourth. This is going to be a difficult integral. OK. <laughs> um, it, it'll clean up, I think. A little bit. <laughs> dr by d theta is 2 theta, so dr by d theta squared is 4 theta squared. d theta. 
I think I see what's happening here. I hope I see it at least. So let's factor theta squared out of the inside. Uh, and now with square roots, when you have two things multiplied underneath the square root, you can give them their own individual square roots. So let's do that. Theta squared. Theta squared plus 4, or d theta. Square root of theta squared is just theta. That's what we're going to say it's just theta. And then we have times root theta squared plus 4. And this will clean up. Okay, good. So let's uh, we now have to do u sub here. So let's take u equals to the harder part here. I also see where the problem is going. So, uh, and I'll explain how I know to take this u sub. Because if we take u equal to theta squared plus 4, it simplifies what's under the radical. And we have the really convenient thing that theta squared derives to 2 theta. So this 2 theta is going to cancel out. Well, it's the theta is going to cancel out with that theta. So this theta cancels with that theta. We still have a 1 half because of that 2 that, that, that's there. So we get 1 half. Oops. I'm going to get rid of the bounds, because I just did a u sub. I'll bring them back later. So we just have the integral of 1 half root u du. And this we know how to integrate directly. It's just a power rule. So square root u is like u to the 1 half. And then when we do a power rule, we add 1 to, the, to 1 half, and we divide by the new power. So the new power, 1 half plus 1, is 3 over 2. When you divide by 3 over 2, you multiply by 2 over 3. So let's multiply by 2 over 3 times u to the 3 over 2. Uh, the 2 and the 2 cancel, so we get 1 third u to the 3 over 2. Now don't forget to unsub and plug in our bounds. So u, we said, was theta squared plus 4. And we evaluate it from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, Oops, to the power of 3 over 2. Don't forget that. <laughs> uh, so we get 4 pi squared plus 4 to the 3 over 2. Minus, now when you plug in 0, you get 1 third times 4 to the 3 over 2. It's going to be an ugly number. We can factor the 4 out of here into the same power rule that we did up there. So we get 4 to the 3 over 2 is 8. Because square root of 4 is 2, 2 to the 3 is 8. So we're going to get 8 thirds pi squared plus 1 to the 3 over 2, which I, ima I, don't, I don't imagine that simplifies. Then 4 to 3 over 2, we said is 8 minus 8 thirds. And I, I call that the answer, I guess. I don't see much more you can do with that. Let me check. Okay. And hey, Muhammad over on YouTube. Uh, you can ask any level of question, but I can only answer questions that are, um, I would say, like, early undergraduate level university and below. So, like, uh, can you, like, calculus? A bit of differential equations, a tiny bit of linear algebra and things, but like before that, it's like pre-calc algebra, geometry, stats. It's correct. Awesome. Let me know if you have any questions. Oh yeah. Hey Muhammad, uh, I go live on YouTube on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Grade nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, sure. I I, I can definitely help with that. Um, I'm I'm live on YouTube on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, starting an hour and 45 minutes ago, whatever that is in your time zone. Uh, thing is, this week I have a little bit of a weirder schedule. I'm going to be live again, I think, tomorrow at my same time, and on Saturday I won't be live. But my normal schedule is Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. How come you don't change limit bounds when you do the U-sub? Uh, you can do that. It's completely valid. Just the way I was taught to do integrals initially was to unsub and do my normal bounds. 
Um, so I am just lazy. Technically, as soon as you do a U sub. <laughs> So I, I was being a little bit lazy. As soon as you do a U-sub, you technically should change the bounds. I just know that I'm going to unsub later and use my old bounds anyway. So why do work that I'm just going to throw out? It is technically incorrect to just get rid of the bounds entirely. But it's not a big deal to me. You know, Repressor would have to be pretty picky to mark you down for that, I feel like. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. As soon as I did the U-sub, I could have converted the bounds and never unsubbed. I, I'm just doing it the way that I was initially taught, which was to unsub. So you use your initial bounds anyway. But if theta is 2 pi, then you would be uh, 4 pi squared plus 4. And if theta is 0, then u is 4. And you should get the same exact answer. They're both completely valid. Hey, Anders. All right, so yeah, Muhammad, I say if you have a question, feel free to type it out in chat now if you want. Um, if we're just hanging out, that's cool too. Do you use WhatsApp? No, I don't. Um, if you want to send me a question, you can put it in my Discord. That's the easiest place to um, like put a screenshot or something. Or you can type it out there in chat. No worries, Cr critical. Uh, no, please don't contact me like directly. <laughs> like I'm happy to answer questions on stream, but uh, I, I, I'd rather not have people, like, messaging me personally asking for math help, because it, it gets pretty overwhelming for me. Yeah. Muhammad, you can ask me a question on stream. Please don't ask me or expect me to answer questions if I'm not on stream. I sometimes will do it, but please, like, that's if I happen to have time and if I want to. Do you remember how to do the rewriting step of the derivative of arc cosine x after applying the theorem of the derivative of an inverse function? Uh... I remember looking at the inverse derivatives, like Penn Center or someone was doing them, and there were a few different ways, like maybe a month ago or something. Uh, I can look at that because I don't have a question to work on right now anyway. All right, uh, Muhammad, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the, if you want to ask me a question, I'll, you can either type it there in chat while I'm live, or if you do join the Discord. This is my Discord right here that I'm showing. Go down to math homework help and make a thread in here. And you can put your screenshot in, in there and I'll get to it once I have a, a moment. Well, I don't have staff, so sometimes other people will help answer them too, and they're very good at explaining things. Um, but if someone else, even if someone else answers, I'm always happy to like address it more on stream and solve it my way too. So, so how long do you answer? The next time I stream, I'll sometimes answer it off stream if I feel like it, but. I'm doing this for free, so I do it when I feel like it and I have time. <laughs> I'm getting the feeling that you have some kind of high expectations for this, Muhammad. But this is this is basically a hobby for me, so I, I if you're looking for something that's very personalized to you and available more, you should really pay pay a private tutor. <laughs> that that's not I. I don't offer private tutoring services, so you're looking in the wrong place if that's something you're interested in. If you're doing late night homework. Uh, 
I don't promise to be on urgently if you have a question. You can try looking... So I, I dual stream to Twitch and YouTube. You can try asking... You can try looking around on Twitch for other people who are streaming math, because there are quite a few people who stream math over on Twitch. But I can't provide what you're asking for. Um, critical thinking has another polar area question between R squared and oh R, R squared equals two sine two theta and R equals one. Uh all right, I, I'm sorry to say, I feel like I always put, put, put you on the back burner, but since Kurt Kirtle's asking a homework question, I'll do that first, and then I'm going to, uh, I'll come back to, to, to your question. And I can do it that um, derivative of an inverse function way. I need to look up the formula again. But, um... Uh, for this one, I'm going to need... So, are, are, are you allowed to use a graphing calculator critical, or... Um... Do you, would you have to do this on your own without a graphing calculator? Uh, I've been doing it for a year plus like three months or so. Let me erase the board. Uh, cr critical. Oh, you went to the restroom. Oh, okay. No worries. So yeah, I'll I'll take a problem now and then and then I'm gonna do Anders's because I think Anders's was just for fun. But I still want to get to it uh, decently soon. Okay. Okay, so uh, Critical is asking, are, are you allowed to use a graphing calculator here? Or will you have to work out where this is on your own? So I guess I have two ideas for how we can try and figure out what the bounds should be. Can I pay for tutoring? Uh, not right now, no. It, it, I, I spend enough time trying to make this stream work. I, I don't have energy to, to do private tutoring. But usually, usually if you look at the math category on Twitch, there's a good chance that someone out there is streaming. So there's links of a good a couple of math streamers there. Well, you said you're, pre you're playing now, Muhammad, so I don't know if it's going to work, but... <laughs> I, 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 I guess, yeah, you, you could have tried that, too. So we have r squared equals 2 sine 2 theta. And 
and r equals one. So yeah, f f figuring out the the bounds here is a uh, going to be the issue. <sighs> r equals one is just a circle of radius one, thankfully. R squared equals two sine two theta. Who the heck knows what that is, though? <laughs> um, so I'm thinking instead of trying to graph that, because off the top of my head, I definitely don't know what's happening with that. I'm wondering what happens if we... Uh, If we square root each side of this, we'd find that r is equal to plus or minus the square root of 2 sine 2 theta. If we know that r equals 1, we can now equate these and see if we can get a solution for theta. We do have to do two different cases for plus and minus, and I guess that's just the way that it's going to be. I, I, I'm wondering if it's better to do graphically or a circular proof. <laughs> I don't know if it's better going to be better to this algebraically like I'm trying here, or to really just go through the pain of trying to graph it. Uh, I'm going to try the algebraic way first. So let's say that 1 is equal to, let's try plus first. 2 sine, oh wait. We're going to square each side anyway. Do we have to worry about the plus and minus at all? We went, I, we're going to have to worry about the plus and minus because our first step is going to be squaring each side anyway. So can we have just done r equals 1 there? And let's do one squared. I think we could have. <laughs> I, I, this might have been unnecessary. If we know that r equals one, I think we just plug our r equals one there. But either way, we we get to the same result, which is um one equals two sine two theta. Let's see if we can work this out for for theta. So one half is equal to sine two theta. Um. We do the arc sine of each side. Arc sine of one half. Uh, I, I know this. Pi over 6 plus 2k pi is equal to 2 theta. Because when you do r sine, you have to do the plus 2k pi or 2n pi thing. Uh, and then there's a second solution too, though, in um, the second quadrant, which is pi minus pi over 6, which is 5 pi over 6. It's 2 theta. <laughs> I don't know how I don't know how we're gonna interpret this. This is this is This is getting a little uh tricky. Show you the graph. Yeah, I just think the graph would be helpful to... <laughs> um, figure out what our bounds are going to be. Hey, Fembox, how's it going? Muhammad, uh, the days of stream are in the description of the YouTube stream. So they do intersect here, but like, how do we interpret this intersection? I mean, we might just need to graph it, unfortunately, because I, I don't I don't really know how to make our bounds yet. Still, there might be a way that you can figure it out just based off this, but I don't really know what direction we're going, like from one to the other, and yeah. So let's figure out if we can graph it. I guess. <laughs> Um, so I, let's make a table. That's not a table. That's, those are axes. <laughs> so if theta, let's take theta equals zero. That'll be the easier one. Theta equals zero, sine is zero. So r squared equals 0, so r equals 0. If theta equals pi over 2, sine of, uh, uh, ooh, sine of pi, 
Oh, wait, so we should look at Pyro 4. Because we'll get a queen number from Pyro 4. So, okay, sign of Pi... Sign of 2 times pi over 4 is sine of pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. Uh, 2 times 1 is 2. So we get plus or minus root 2 because it's r squared. So I don't know how to do the scaling on this. Um, we have 0, 0. At pi over 4, we have plus or minus root 2. So root 2 is just beyond 1. And it's also minus root 2, so we also go down there. At the same time, I don't really know how that works with, with polar. I assume we're just going to get, like, a reflection here. Um, now, if that equals pi root 2, what, is that, what happens there? It's like sine of pi, which is 0. So, is it going to be, like, a petal, like a flower? Oh, it's going to be a flower, isn't it? We, we even looked at these uh, at some point, critical thinking, right? So yeah, sine sin of 3 pi over 4 is like sine of 3 pi over 2. Um, or maybe that's just r. When it's r squared, it might get something else for this reason here. Um, three pi over, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. And you, that does not compute. DNA because you get square root of a negative number. Interesting. Continue the table over here. <laughs> uh, let's get sine of just pi. That's zero, right? Because sine of two pi is zero. Uh, if theta is five pi over four, can you explain why pi over four is root two? Sure. Yeah, I'm just all uh, this in my head because I'm. <laughs> The graph of this is... I'm not, I'm not quite sure what to think about the graph of this. Um, so if you plug pi over 4 in for theta there, I'll do it down here. You get r squared equals 2 sine 2 times pi over 4. r squared equals 2 sine of pi over 2. Um, sine of pi over 2 is just 1. If you know your unit circle, so r squared equals 2 times 1, r squared equals 2. Now we square root each side, and that's where the plus or minus comes from. So that's why pi over 4 gave us plus or minus root 2, because it's r squared. <sighs> um, well, I don't know if there's any, any others that you have a question on. Um, we would have gotten something like plus or minus root 2 down here, except it came out to be an, an negative 2 instead, and root of negative 2 makes no sense in this context. No worries, you're critical. Let me know if any of those are, like, tripping you up, because I'm kind of, like, glossing over the actual math here. <laughs> um, and I assume we've done one full period now. Let's just do a sanity check by doing 5 pi over 4, and I expect to get the same answer as for pi over 4. Uh, so if we have sine of 2 times 5 pi over 4, that's like sine of 5 pi over 2. What is 5 pi over 2? Um, 5 pi over 2 minus 2 pi is 5 pi over 2 minus 4 pi over 2 is pi over 2. Aha! Because pi over 2. Right, like that became pi over 2 as well. Okay. <laughs> so it does cycle back through our same. Really? So I think the shape we get, it's like a diagonal infinity? Because we go when theta is 0, r is 0. And then when theta is pi over 4, we get plus or minus root 2. And then when we come back up to pi over 2, we come back down to 0. So it seems like we're getting that sideways infinity. At this point, let's plug it into a graphing calculator to make sure I'm not going completely off the deep end here. <laughs> so, you know, on testing, you wouldn't be able to do this step, but I just don't want to do all this work just to realize I had the wrong graph. What is happy? Oh, it's happy Gilmore. Okay. <laughs> 
This is a random dude eating a golf ball. <laughs> R squared equals 2 sine 2 theta. Oh, you don't do polar. Oh wait, linear in R. Never mind, you do do polar, you just don't like R squared. Square root. Aha! Um... Oh wait, does it become a flower if we do the negative? No, okay, good. Hey, I got it! Um... Oh wait. Is that one exactly though, or what is this? Why is... Pi root 4 is exactly 1? I said it was root plus or minus root 2. Am I crazy? You plug pi root 4 into that. Uh, Hamudi Halima, thanks for the follow. R equals root 2 at 1, 1. Oh, duh. Thank you, Fembox. <laughs> okay, so this is right. <laughs> I just don't know how right triangles work, evidently. Okay, that's a cool one to, to graph. Um, actually, uh, just have the cleaner graph. Look, we, we can now figure out our bounds. Um, okay, so yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, so, so critical. I was getting confused because uh, obviously Desmos just uses Cartesian coordinates. I, sh I shouldn't say the word uh, obvious. I thought for some reason, so I, I got that the radius here is square root of 2. Oh, that's you, Muhammad. Uh, okay, well, well, thanks for following over on Twitch as well. Um, for some reason, I thought this was radius 1 because it's that 1, 1 in Cartesian coordinates. But if you draw the right triangle, it, like this distance from the origin to one one is square root of two, so my graph does match. But actually, my graph on the board does not match because the radius. Wait. Oh, okay. Yeah, I keep getting okay. Yeah, I keep confusing myself with a circle. Okay. <laughs> okay, my, my manager thought I was right. It was just um. If I could remove these freaking Cartesian coordinates, I would. Cause I'm getting confused on them. But if you're at the point one comma one in Cartesian coordinates, you are root two away from the origin, and I was getting tripped up on that interpretation when you go from polar to Cartesian. What we have here is right. Like, the distance from here to over here is indeed root 2. I thought because it was 1, 1 in Cartesian coordinates that I did something wrong. Like, it should, should be radius 1, but no. So, I, I was just doing a CNA check with what my graph had. <laughs> I hope that kind of made sense to you. I, we've done everything right. I, I was just get I, I was getting tripped on make sure the graph is good, but it is good. Okay, so <laughs> all we've done so far is wrap our head around how each of these functions look, and now we need to figure out our bounds. Um, I think this question be this involved. I'm sorry for making you wait. <laughs> uh, because I thought I'd be able to do it like qu quicker. Um. Pi over 12 and 5 pi over 12 look good too, based on this graph. Yeah, those are... Yeah. You can change the layout to be polar? Really? That'd be amazing. Oh, cool. I 
I didn't know that the decimals could, could do that. So if we just... So if we want the area between these two curves, we want this entire region in here. So do we need to do... So like, I, I guess what I'm concerned about is if we go from... If we just do one integral from pi over 12 to 5 pi over 12, are we capturing... Like, we need to include, like, this bottom portion of the area, too, right? Just from, like, you know, this pi over... Like, from theta equals 0 to pi over 12. So I think we need to do an integral from 0 to pi over 12 of just this diagonal infinity. An integral from... I, I might be overthinking th this, though. But also an integral from... Am I overthinking this? I'm okay. Thank you, Anders. Question: Do you use a graphing tablet for math? And if so, what model? Welcome in eighty six. Um, graphics tablet for math. I do not. There are my people in chat who do it. I know that like other math streamers use tablets to write their math on. I don't remember what they have though. Uh, it's like Pen Center uses a tablet. You could try asking him the next time he's live. Um, Ian Suki uses a tablet too. I, I think Ian Suki just mentioned using an iPad. I can't remember if other. I think Obi does as well. I'll just do a general shout out to all the matchmakers at this point, but <laughs> um, out of the list here, Pen Center, Ian Stuckey, and Obi, I think use tablets. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for 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 the question. Obi does for sure. Okay. Thanks, Super Brain. Um. So, okay, so we need, I guess, three integrals, although I imagine two of them will be the same value. We need an integral from 0 to pi over 12 of just this diagonal infinity. You know, we should actually... Well, and another integral from pi over 12 to 5 pi over 12 of... One will do the trick? Are it, are we capturing the area from zero to doing the first quadrant? Is there a way to do it all in one? That would be better. I'd rather do that. I was about to, to wonder if we go from zero to pi over twelve, it's gonna get mirrored, isn't it? No, it's not. Well, we'd have to do we have to involve this one here as well. Because it's R squared. So yeah, it would get mirrored if it's R squared. But if we do the square root, then... We're, we're going to have to do the square root. So we can worry just about the positive part of the curve. Uh, hey, real... Vin over on YouTube? Uh, doing an epsilon delta limit with a constant function? I might be able to work that out. I am a little bit rusty on epsilon delta, but I may be able to help you out once I'm through with this question that I'm working on. Shahir, can you solve the plus transformation questions? Kind of. I can apply the formula to get the coefficients. I I don't know. Oh wait. Oh shoot. No, Laplace. I'm thinking of for you for some reason. The Laplace transformations I still like kinda. I'm I'm not too good with Laplace though. Uh 
critical word. I'm trying to work out how to find moment bounds, I guess. Using symmetry. From 0 to pi over 6, you integrate red. Pi over 6 to pi over 4, the green. Then add the results and multiply by 4. Oh gosh, you hear? Uh... I think I'm going to be too rusty on my Laplace transforms for that. I'll come over to the Twitch chat if someone wants to speak up on it, but there's some special functions in there that I don't remember how those work. Do you mean 0 to pi over 12, Anders? Symmetry over y equals x. Yeah, so I guess we can worry about only the... the... You're right. It is symmetric over y equals x. And able to make your Discord account. I see someone join the server. I, I don't know who that was, though. Um, you can try to type it out there in chat, but... I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I recall, okay, so that, that makes sense. And so, yeah, we could. <laughs> uh, right. That we still need two integrals for that approach, though, right? It depends on the question. If you if you type, if you type the question, I can tell you if I can help. Um. Do we need to worry about doing... So we're going to do from 0 to pi over 12 of just the red curve. And you're saying we can do pi over 12 to pi over 4 of just the green? We don't have to do green minus red? I think we have to do... If it's just a circle, we wouldn't have to do an integral necessarily, but I feel like we have to do outer minus lower, because the red curve still has values for pi over 12 to pi over 4. No, it doesn't. Never mind. I thought it would be... Okay, no. I, I'm on board with what Andrew is saying then. Okay, so yeah, you're right, so we're in, it is just a sector of a circle. I'll probably do it with integrals anyway. And it'll turn out to be the same thing, just the sector of a circle. Okay, so critical. Let me back up and explain the approach that we're going to use here. Um, the issue that, we've, that we're have running into is we need to capture... Um... It's not as simple as just doing outer curve minus lower curve here because it changes depending on what angles we're talking about. So we need to split up these angles into like different intervals. And the approach that's being used here is um, we're going to cover data is from 0 to pi over 12, just with the red curve here, where they in intersect, because the, the circle is completely irrelevant here. It's not going to contribute any area. So our first integral is going to be from 0 to pi over 12, just this curve here. Um, and then, from... Oh, I can't really adjust it for r equals 1, can I? Uh, and then for, between pi over 12 and pi over 4 right here, we're going to worry about just the circle, because then the diagonal infinity doesn't contribute any area there. And then beyond pi over 4, like all the way over here and around the unit circle, we're going to use uh, symmetry to take care of the rest. So we're symmetric. Looks like this lower half here is symmetric to this upper half here. 
So let's multiply by two. And then this entire area here is going to be symmetric to the entire area down there. So multiply by two again. So we're, we're, we're going to take only this like quarter of the area here, figure it out, and then multiply by four. Yeah, we're really just taking the inside part of each function super brain. You're right. If I'm interpreting, actually, the area of the region. Wait, am I doing this backwards? Are we supposed to get the area out here? Which one is inside which? I didn't even think about that. Lies inside both curves. No, lies inside both curves. Never mind. We, we, we did it right. If it was out here, it wouldn't lie inside r equals 1. So it, it has to lie inside both curves. Okay. See, so yeah, the approach I just said is right. Critical, I hope I didn't explain that too confusingly. I'll come over to the board and set things up. Um, and then maybe it'll be more helpful if I draw it out as well. <laughs> what exactly is happening? Uh... Okay. So, um, we're going to set up one integral that goes from 0 to theta equals pi over 12 and get just that blue area there. And we're going to get another integral from pi over 12 to pi over 4 and get just the area here. And so if we can get the area of these two regions, using symmetry, we can figure out the rest, because this is just a reflection of that. So the area is going to be the same here. And this entire thing is symmetric down there. So we get to just boil it down to a simpler problem rather than trying to do everything all at once. So between theta equals 0 and theta equals pi over 12, we only have to worry about that diagonal infinity, which was the r squared equals 2, two sine 2 theta. And further, like we need to be just with r. So we do need to square root each side, and we're going to take only the positive part because the positive part goes with this part out here. The negative part goes with the part over here, which we don't want. So, um, oh, hey, Central. <laughs> uh, do you cover the pi over 12 intercept, or was it case? Uh, we did work it out on the board. I, I wasn't showing it. Oh, you said, oh, right, thanks. Yeah. Discord link is right there. Okay, how's it going, Central? Um... So getting that blue region down there, let's set up the integral from... Oh, wait. What's the formula for the area of the polar curve? Is it pi or... It's one half r squared? Can't say going to bed? All right, see it. Thanks for saying hi. Be, be thinking of you? I, I'm sure you always are. Okay, yeah, it's, it's one half r squared. Okay. So the area of a region of a polar curve is one half r squared. So let's say one half from theta equals zero to theta equals pi over 12 of our function there, root two sine two theta d theta. Now let's add our green region to the same one half r squared. One half from pi over 12 to pi over four uh, r is equal to 1, so it's 1 squared d theta. 
you could just do that using geometry too. It's just the area of a sector of a circle, but we'll do it the, the calculus way. Don't forget to... Oh, thank you, Fembox. It's one half R squared. Okay, that'll make the integral much nicer. Root of... The integrated square root of sine is not easy. <laughs> oh, that makes it... That makes life much better. Okay, so this is our setup. Now we just have to execute. Um... I was even saying to square it too, and I just didn't square it. D theta. This one we just integrate directly. One half, uh, one integrates to theta. Pi over 12 to pi over four. Uh, sine of two theta, I'm gonna mentally do a u sub with u equals two theta. Um, because it's a simple one, I'm just gonna do it though. Uh, we're gonna end up multiplying by one half because it's two theta. So that two goes away. It'll be one half in sine it integrates to negative cosine. So negative cosine two theta from zero to pi over twelve. Twelve. Okay. One half theta pi over twelve to pi over four. Now we get to plug in um, minus one half. Cosine pi over six minus plus one half cosine of zero because minus a, a negative becomes plus one half theta times pi over four minus one half times pi over twelve. Hopefully, it's going to be a positive number. Um, cosine of pi over six is root three over two times one half is root three over four. Cosine of zero is one, so we get plus a half. Plus pi over eight. Minus pi over 24, right? Okay, kind of looking annoying. Uh, and so if we combine these two fractions, that'll be 2 over 4, so we get 2 minus root 3 over 4. These two fractions, that's 3 pi over 24, 2 pi over 24, so pi over 12. All right, so that's the area for just that quarter there. Um, now we need to multiply it by 4, and that's our answer. It's a four. So the four cancels there, and then that 12 becomes a three. So two minus root three plus pi over three. And I think that's our final answer. Okay. Part of the formula. Right. Thanks, Fitfenbox, for, for getting that. Oh, let me take my cam away because I'm blocking it, aren't I? Thank you, everyone watching. Oh, I assume she here left. Uh, Real Vin, are you still here? It's correct. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's see. Fenbox had a really nice save. Enders was helping out. I hope I didn't miss anyone. Oh, su su super brain. Okay. So, Andrew was asking about the derivative of arc cosine x. I simply just want to see how I do it. And if we want to do that inverse derivative formula inverse function derivative you have one more question uh feel free, feel free to put it in chat i am going to do this one first but it shouldn't be too long okay this formula here 
Really? I feel like it's supposed to look... If you don't mind, can we be besties? <laughs> Uh, I feel like it's part of your plot, Mohammed, so I don't know how, how to reply to that. I guess it is that, that formula. Uh, this is a calculus question I'm about to, 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 to work on. I want to get the exact phrasing that Andrew said. Oh, just certain friend derivative arc cosine x. Okay. Uh, Anders, are you here? I'll, I'll type in chat too. Just in case they have, they have the stream muted. Okay. Oh, you you are here. Okay, cool. All right. So I, I think just do it with the. Uh, I haven't actually used the formula before for the inverse function derivative. That was a fun problem, though, uh, trying to figure out how the graph looked of these polar curves and then how to break down the area of it. Okay. So if we're saying, actually, how do we apply the formula? F inverse. Okay, so if f of x, uh, blue marker needs a break. We'll set f of x be cosine x. And f inverse x to be arc cosine x. And we want d dx of f inverse x. It'll be 1 over f prime composed of f inverse. So f prime is minus sine x, right? So minus sine of arc cosine of x. Then I guess we need to simplify that. So set up a right triangle. Uh, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So x, 1, root 1 minus x squared. So sine of this is opposite over uh, hypotenuse. So 1 over minus root 1 minus x squared. I guess we could rationalize it if we wanted to. Over 1 minus... Is that, is that the answer? That doesn't feel right. Did I apply it wrong? Uh, hey, Oopal, thanks for the follow. Oopal? I don't know. How do you set up the triangle? Uh, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so x over 1. Adjacent is x, hypotenuse is 1. Pythagorean theorem, hypotenuse minus x squared, square root. I think the right triangle seems okay. That doesn't, I don't think that's the answer though, is it? <laughs> You know, they bother rationalizing it? Oh, I guess it, it is only valid for... Uh, negative 1, less than equal to x, less than 1. But that's fine, because arc cosine is the same restriction, right? So... Um, like, we're, we're never going to get a 
definition for this that goes outside of this interval, I don't think. You don't think they bother rationalizing this? Hey, underscore. Um, just want to make sure that I'm not crazy. Oh, hey, I am right. Okay. They, they just don't rationalize it. It's Pembox says. Okay. Um, my streams... My minimum is usually two hours. I often go... Like three or four hours though, Muhammad. So I have seen, I think it was Penn Center do the other way where you um, do it with implicit di di differentiation, which is more involved in just using this formula. But if you want to discuss that, I'm happy to like work through that too. Yeah, and it's much easier to remember than um, the formula way. So I, I I never saw that, that formula at all until Zach's analysis class a few months ago. I was never ta taught it or anything. All right, no no worries, Anders. Um, completed my studies. I have a bachelor's in applied math, Muhammad. Yeah, minor in computer science. Uh, I'd like to do more s s studies, though. I'm not currently a student. All right, so Critical, are you still here? Do you have your question? Um, thanks for, for hanging on. I'll um, at critical as well. I am Muhammad, don't worry, I was asking someone else, because they said they have a question. And I asked them to wait for a minute. They may have, like, stepped out, though. If you need to, you derive d by dx of f inverse by differentiating the relation f inverse of f equals identity. Oh, okay. Or f of inverse. Okay. Oh, because the, that uh, the chain rule will give you what you want there. That makes sense. Do you have any tips for solving recurrence problems more easily? Uh, well, first of all, welcome in. I'll, I guess I'll call you Koopal. Um, recurrence problems have never been my strong suit. Do I have any tips? <laughs> I assume you're trying to like go from a recurrence relation to like a closed form, like without the uh, recursive part. Which, I don't know if I have any tips for that. I kind of struggle with those too, if I'm being honest. Um, we can try Googling it a little bit. Help in solving past papers on Discord? I, I don't know what you mean with past papers, I guess. Journey functions might help. I was reading about them yesterday. I've heard the term generating function before. I don't really know.
um, what they are, though. Like, I know you could try plugging numbers in and trying to make a separate pattern entirely based off the results. Hmm. Yeah, it does seem like one of those tricky things to answer. Um, where the technique probably depends on the relation at hand. So yeah, I, I'm sure I can help you out more, Koopal, but I'm not experienced enough with these to really give you general tips. I've encountered them before, I just haven't had to work with them enough to have that good an understanding of them. <laughs> so I try to give attention to everyone e equally, but yeah, if you only can think about, about it like that, Muhammad. Hmm. That's kind of cool. Yeah, um, if you're only encountering mass streamers for the first time, there are other streamers who might have a better idea of what's hap of like what to tell you. These ones who I know the best that I can recommend the most. Um, out of these streamers, I'm not sure who would best be able to help you. No worries, critical. Uh, for me to post your question now, um, Zach or Easy Two Pi might know, um, Stuki might know, and Obi might know, and Simplex Pachinko. Oh, you meant a question like that critical. Sorry, I thought you had an entirely separate question. Oh, shoot. Okay, yeah, if you, if you had asked that earlier, I, I would have addressed that. Sorry. Um, and hey, Brian, what is a parabola? I think you know the answer. Are, um... It's an infinite bowl. <laughs> um, Pi over 12 has a limit bounds. Um, well, let me go back through and, and I'll show you. Yeah, sorry, wait, did you have a qu another question? I thought you meant like you had a completely separate problem to work on, which is why I said. Um, I'll do it after. But our questions were r squared equals, or our functions were r squared equals 2 sine 2 theta and r equals 1. So, if we did the prudent thing and graphed them before we tried to find their intersections, um, We're expecting, you know, two positive intersections, like somewhere vaguely around pi over six ish. Obviously, the graph is far from intact, and somewhere like up there. So it's just nice to look at it initially to kind of set your expectations for how many and where your intersections are, are going to be. Um, to actually solve for them. Hmm. We want to find where both of these equations are true at the same time. So we want r equals 1 to be true. And we want r squared equals 2 sine 2 theta to, to be true. So the simplest thing to do here is say, oh, well, if r has to equal 1, just plug 1 in over here for that r and solve it for theta.
So we say that 1 squared now is equal to 2 sine 2 theta. 1 squared, of course, is just 1. Um, let's divide the 2 over. Uh, now we'll take the arc sine of each side. And um, we're thinking that the arc sine is only defined between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we have to worry about potential solutions in quadrant uh, 2 and 3. Like, you know, arc sine is only defined on these two quadrants, 4 and 1. We have to worry, there's going to be another solution over here as well. And because sine is periodic, each of those solutions has more solutions after it. Um, so... When we do arc sine of one half, you just plug into the calculator, arc sine of one half is going to give you um, pi over six, knowing my, my unit circle. And whatever you, arc sine gives you, you have to do um, plus two k pi, and k is just any integer positive, negative, or zero. It's not going to be important for this problem, but just I'm saying in general, if, you, if, if we take the arc sine of each side, in this exact problem, this is going to be completely irrelevant. It's not. It's not. It's not a bad idea to just keep it there out of habit. As equal to two theta. So that's the solution in quadrant one. We do have another solution in quadrant two. Funny poster idea: human head profile, facing board with the words inside. Streamer goes here. <laughs> Um, so we know that sine is one half at pi over six for our theta. Oh, who's that? Hard blocked. <laughs> I thought it was a raid. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Thank you so much for the ten dollars hard blocked. Oh, that that husky scream! I forgot. Like I, I have, I have like a shortened version of that for for the raid alerts too. Um, thank you so much, Hardlux, for for the ten dollar tip. Um, how to show the kids the dogs? Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm on the big screen again. Oh, heck yeah. That was painful to hear. Oh, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, Andrew. I hope it doesn't come across too loud on the stream. Oh, okay, Brian. See, so yeah, I assume this was building up into something else. Um, f of x and a two distinct primes p and q. Really? That's crazy, Brian. What like math for you? Awesome. It wasn't loud at all. Okay. Well, the the the. the just poor dog. Oh, it's just freaking out for for no reason. It's not like in pain or anything. It, it <laughs> there's a whole like rabbit hole on YouTube of huskies just like yelling for for no reason, and I I think they're like really cute. Um, sorry for being personal. I feel kind of curious to ask what you eat. Oh, I was just e eating a cop trout. Okay, so sorry. Back to the problem. And Brad, I'm interested to hear more about that too. But um, Critical is asking how we get the intersection points of these curves. Uh, so we got pi over 6 as one of our solutions. We have to worry about uh, quadrant 2, though, because that's where sine is also positive, and it's also going to hit 1 half over there. So we know it's going to be 1 half on the unit circle. We have pi over 6, and over here, which is going to be pi minus pi over 6. Like, whatever this works out to be. So I actually just did the fraction math of pi minus pi over 6, and got 5 pi over 6. So we, we get two solutions, like two, I guess, base solutions out of this, and then... We add on the 2k pi, 
Uh, we haven't solved a quite birthday yet because it's two theta, so we need to divide everything through by two. So when I do that, we get pi over 12 plus k times pi equals theta. And when we do it down here, we get um, 5 pi over 12 plus k pi equals theta. Um, we didn't end up using the second solution here. But just in terms of being thorough, I still got all the solutions here just in case they would be relevant. With the way we ended up dividing up this, uh, like these curves, all we needed was that first intersection point of pi over 12. There's other scenarios though where you might need both of them. I don't know if there's going to be a scenario where you need to go like, where you have to use something other than zero for k. You probably don't have to. Um, but this is like the technically correct solution that we don't need every piece of. We really only need the pi over 12. Though that makes sense, critical. Uh, we have a different Muhammad here, Muhammad Nadim Aziz. Can you explain trig circle like the unit circle? Yeah. Uh, we're actually doing something related to that right now, but I'll, I'll try to explain it more in depth in a second. And we also have Dhruv Sharma. Can you explain how to solve the series sigma n equals 1 to infinity of e to the n over n e to the n minus n? Ooh. Uh, what do you mean by solve? Like, find a formula for its sum? I'm not sure how we do that. We can try to wor work it out, though. You know what the second equation is for? Um, it's just all the solutions that are possible. Or critical we don't we didn't end up using it at all in the integral that we did um i was just getting every solution possible because at that point in the problem we hadn't decided how we're going to split up the curves yet um but once we know where all the intersection points are, then we can start making that decision, I think. I mean, you could also th think ahead and, and not w worry about it. Hey, Bio. Uh, I... I have two people asking questions before, but... Um, I can look at yours after. No worries, critical. So I'm not sure. So it's convergent or divergent for that series. That'll be an interesting one. I don't know how we're gonna do that. Um, I'm gonna transfer over to the Twitch chat in case someone wants to start looking at it. That's gonna be to figure out if that's convergent or divergent. Let me address Muhammad Nadim Aziz's question first. It could be a direct comparison. You're right. Uh, let me try and briefly go over the trig circle, which I'm interpreting as the unit circle. And then I'll address uh, that series. Pork or beef? Uh, I like both, but I, I, I choose one, I guess, beef. Do more of the, uh, I do as much as I can. Um, but doing any more than three days a week is um, hard. Okay, so, uh, no, I, I, I just do this three, three days a week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And this Saturday, I'm going to, I won't be able to stream, so I'm going to change my Saturday stream for a Friday stream to, tomorrow. Um, so yeah, uh, Muhammad N N N Nadim Aziz, I'd say... I guess we say explain the, the unit circle. Is there a part of it that you're more or less confused on? Um, I'll, I'll kind of generally explain what the unit circle is. Um, so it's just a circle of radius 1, and we've figured out a bunch of the points on this circle in advance 
about pi and radians. Okay. So, um, we figured out a bunch of points on the circle in advance just because it, they come up very, uh, very frequently in um, calculations, and it's just helpful to have these offhand. Um, it's the afternoon here. I'm in California. It's almost four in the afternoon. Um, and we find that it's convenient to use radians instead of degrees. Um, they, they convert between each other. It's just like Celsius and Fahrenheit. But um, radians are basically a fraction of the area of the circle. So the entire area of the circle, if you use the formula pi r squared, the radius is 1. Wait, that makes no sense. Wait, am I? Oh, wait, the area of a sector. I... How, are, how are radians constructed? Why, why don't I know this? <laughs> I guess it's half the, or... See, I tend to just use the inner circle without thinking about it. Each of these radians, I guess, is twice the area. It's something that I should know offhand. I was, I'm just going to say it's based off the area of a circle. Where, like, if you fill in, you know, for, from this x-axis up to pi over 6, that's just a part of the area of the circle. The yeah, edges are going to be twice the area of the circle, so... Um, as I, my area thing isn't that important, but that's just, like, how these are constructed. Um... How, how am I explain? I'm, expl I'm doing a poor job of explaining this because I don't have like a explanation that I always go to with this. Let me maybe go into how we actually use the unit circle because um, that'll be like more practical. So, if you have sine, cosine, tangent, or cosine, cosecant, cotangent. Um, you you would take any of those of any of these angles in degrees or radians. It's all the same. But if you're just doing it first, I'm probably going to use radians to get used to it. So if you're trying to compute sine of pi over 6, the unit circle comes in handy because it's figured out for you. Um, if you have to do sine of pi over 6, you look at the point that's associated with pi over 6, and you take the y value. So we say sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. If you have cosine of pi over 6, you take the x value, so root 3 over 2. And if you have tangent, you do y divided by x. Um, so you do 1 half divided by root 3 over 2, which comes out to be root 3 over 3. Um, and th and that's, the, that's probably the most important thing about the unit circle is how you use it. Um, you're often made to or, you know, students are often made to memorize the entire unit circle. But this thing does follow a pattern. Um, your points are always going to be either like, you know, 0 and 1, root 3 over 2 and 1 half, or root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 2. It's just different combinations and different positive and, and negatives of those same things. Like, you'll never have any, any other numbers. So what you can do is you can memorize just the first quadrant here, and use the knowledge here to figure out what the second quadrant is, the third quadrant, and the fourth quadrant. Because um, you can notice, like, you know, over here, pi, pi over 3, if you memorize that it's 1 half comma root 3 over 2, you can come over here to the second quadrant, and 2 pi over 3 is just negative a half in root 3 over 2. And you know in the second quadrant, x has to be negative and y has to be positive, so all you do is you flip the sign on the 1 half. So that's kind of a trick I use to know the unit circle and kind of move around between quadrants. Um, 
this is one of the things where you have to use it a lot and get used to it. Um, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around at first, but it is a super helpful thing. Um, oh, and sorry, I didn't see that. I'll see you around. Thanks for, for asking the question. So, Bio, you're saying if we have, let's say, sine of x equals 1 half, we know that 1x is for sure, pi over 6, how do you get the other one? So, sorry, I didn't uh, see that one either, Bio. Um, if you, so, yeah, you're, you're right. If you have sine of x equals 1 half, then you have to look. You know for sure that pi over 6 is one of them. Um, you, get, you get the other solution, which we can cheat and look at the unit circle and know that it's 5 pi over 6. But you get the other solution by thinking about how sine of x is equal to positive 1 half. And where else on the unit circle is do you get that positive 1 half value where your y is positive? And that's in quadrant 2. Specifically, it's going to be just above the negative x-axis. If it's 1 half, because 1 half is less than root 2 over 2 is less than root 3 over 2. Well... Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to explain, Bio. It, you do have to memorize this first quadrant, but if you do have that memorized, you can work out what this is. So uh, I'll go explain it on the board. And then I promise uh, through, if you're here still, I'll, I'll, I'll work on your problem. This took a bit longer to get through than I thought. Okay. So if you're if you just if you just are willing to memorize that sine of pi over six is one half. Um the first step is to figure out what other quadrant your solution is in, and you can know that based off uh, whether this is positive or negative. Um, sine goes with the y values, and the other place where the y values are positive are over here in quadrant two. And the way that I work it out from here is we have three options for where it can be. Um, and I just know that or I, or I mean, you don't have to know, but or you don't have to, to to memorize it. But I just do it literally from like least to greatest or greatest to least. Like one half has to be below root two over two, which has to be below root three over two. Like wait, I'm thinking about the actual values of y. Um. Okay, this one is really just lower. That's a little bit higher, and that's the highest. And one half is lower than root two over two is lower than root three over two. So we want this thing right here. So it's like pi over 6 is reflected over, but we need to get the actual unit circle value. So what we do is we take pi here, and we subtract out that pi over 6. And then we get the angle that we want. So you do pi minus pi over 6. 6 pi over 6 minus pi over 6. And you get your desired angle of 5 pi over 6. That's how I do the, the... I usually do it in my head, but that's how I work out this unit circle stuff. Um, hey, is that Kurt is bad or Kurt is bad? I, either way, welcome in. You thought there's a formula for this? I don't know if there's a general formula for it. But if it was root 3 over 2, you can do the same exact process here. So, like, you'd you have to memorize that, like, these are your possible options. But by the way the coordinate system works, you know what order those options go in. Like, you, you can figure it out always. So, if we take your other example and doing it with sine is root 3 over 2, I, I, I know it's going to correlate with this angle up here because root 3 over 2 is our greatest option that we have. 
And if it's root 3 over 2, then the x coordinate must be 1 half. Because root 3 over 2 never matches with itself, and root 2 over 2 always matches with itself. So I know it's this upper angle here, and I know the upper angle is pi over 3. Um, and then we do the same exact logic, where the other place where sine is positive is over here in quadrant 2. And we want it to be root 3 over 2, so we also need the upper angle over here for the same exact reason we took the upper angle over there. Um, so we know it's going to be like pi over 3 above the negative x-axis, and then we do the same exact logic with taking the entire angle pi and subtracting out that pi over 3 part. So pi minus pi over 3 is the same as 3 pi over 3 minus pi over 3 is equal to 2 pi over 3. So that's how you work your way around the unit circle. When it's cosine, do we add or subtract? Um, if it was cosine... Just remember sine of 15 and cosine of 15 use angle addition? Oh god. <laughs> that probably works. Um... So if it's cosine, that does change things. So let's say we have cosine is root 3 over 2. Um, this time we're thinking about our x values and not our y values. So the x value that's furthest right is root 3 over 2, so we want this lowest angle here. So our first solution is going to be pi over 6, because that's the, the lowest angle there. And now, since cosine of x goes with our x values, the other place where cosine is positive is down here in quadrant 4. So you're right, we do need to do a separate process here. Well, it'll be, it's the same idea, but we have a different like um, quadrant. So if we want to get this lower angle down here, we know the entire angle is 2 pi. You want to get rid of that little pi over 6 part. That's right down below. So that's how we're going to take 2 pi and do minus pi over 6. So I think you always subtract it from the entire angle to answer your question. Uh, we get 12 pi over 6 minus pi over 6 is 11 pi over 6. So that should be our second answer. The different logic, but it's similar. OK. Fair enough. Can you solve this derivative next? Oh yeah, it looks like we got a quotient rule there. We can definitely do that. Um, am I missing... Oh yeah, Dr Daruv, are, are you still here? Uh, Daruv did ask the question first. But I've been bad about getting to in a timely manner. If they left, then I'll get right over to yours, Curtis. Oh, shoot. Bio did ask a question first, too. Uh, let's see how long... Okay. Let me see what... Because uh, Curtis's question, I don't think will be too long. Let me see how long your question is going to be, Bio. I don't see Drew speaking up. Um... Apparently, I am. I, 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 it'd be nice if we could, like, um, oh, this is not a helpful translation. What is this? Why? Uh, thanks for the follow, Curtis. He's basically in a unit circle helps to solve trig equations. Um, yeah, if you could, bio. If you're reading Google Translate, it doesn't like this. <laughs> um, oh. Well, if it's solving this over 0 to pi over 2, that looks hard. The sum of all solutions of the... Oh, God. 
So yeah, Muhammad, I guess I explained the basic version of how the unit circle helps us to solve trig equations with what I was just doing on the board. Um, I, I, I have a few other questions I need to get to, though. So I would have to come back around to explain it more. I'm sorry. Okay, so... This one's going to be complicated, Bio. I'm going to go through Curtis's first because um, it's very di direct and I know what to do. This one, I don't know what to do offhand and it's going to take me a while to, to, to work it out. So, Curtis, uh, you want to get the derivative of that thing. We can definitely do. Let me make sure I'm copying things down right. In green? Oh, I was actually about to choose green anyway. But yeah, uh, thank you for, for telling me that. I'm, I'm happy to uh, try to accommodate anything that would help you. Three root x squared plus nine, x squared plus one. Okay. And we want to find the derivative. So because we have division here, we need to do the quotient rule. And the quotient rule is always annoying for me to, 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 to memorize. Um, I just remember that the formula... So I just have to memorize the formula looks something like... Uh, it's not exactly like this, but I always remember it looks something like this. And then one of these is prime in each of these. And that's part I always forget. Uh, some I just think that it's deriving the numerator first. So I, I take this that I have memorized, and I remember that's prime, which just means this g prime is here. Other people say um, low d high to mean like, you know, the, de the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus high d low so high d low and uh oops over g squared so that uh that you know it's, it's different ways of memorizing the same thing i guess hey columns Dear, uh i don't have a brother <laughs> They're, they're, they're just a, a chatter. <laughs> All right, so this is the formula that, that we need to, to use. It's kind of a lot, but that's just the way that the formula is, unfortunately. So here, f of x is the numerator, g of x is the denominator. Um, and actually, just to break in, if you're just like using the quotient rule for the first time, it can sometimes be helpful to um, write out f of x and g of x and the derivatives explicitly, like separately. So let's do that here. So we're going to name f of x as 3 root x squared plus 9. Um, and g of x as x squared plus 1, the denominator. Uh, I, 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 can't, I can't make any promises with that problem, Bio. It's a hard one. I, I will try it, but I don't know if, I, if I'll be able to, to do it. Um, all right, so we know we've named our fx and jfx. Let's get f prime and g prime now, and then we'll plug into that formula. So f prime, the 3 is just going to stay there. It's a coefficient. The square root is like an exponent of 1 half. So it's um, like 3 times x squared plus 9 to the 1 half. So we're going to have to use chain rule here. It, uh, our outer function is power rule with a one half. So the power comes down and you subtract one from it. So we're going to do three times a half 
the power, and the inside stays the same. Now you do one half and minus one is negative a half for the new exponent. And now chain rule again on the inside, the derivative of x squared plus nine is two x. We'll, we'll clean this up in, in a second. Actually, we'll clean up now. Uh, we have one over two and two, so those can cancel. Uh, we'll get three x, and that's a negative exponent. So you don't have to do this, but I'm gonna write it as over root x squared plus nine. Because one half is also a square root, and negative exponent means you bring it, bring it down to the denominator. Hey, Windex, don't play with me. Oh. Well, sorry if you got called out. <laughs> oh, I, I'm I'm not one of the great Sherlock. That you're 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 giving me too much praise. Um. Hey, corrupt. Do you have trouble understanding problems? No worries, Kurt Curtis. Let me know if you uh, are, uh, have any questions so far. Um, for now, I'll keep on moving through the problem. So we know our f prime x is that. Let's get our g prime now. This one's a, uh, a lot simpler. x squared plus 1 derives to 2x. So now we know fx, we know g of x, we know f prime x, we know g prime x, so we can plug into the formula. Oh, well, well, thank you, Windex. Okay. So the derivative of this now. So f prime times g. So f prime, we said, is this. 3x over root x squared plus 9 times the original g, x squared plus 1, minus... Now f of x, the original, 3 root x squared plus 9 times g prime, which we said is 2x, over the denominator squared, x squared plus 1 squared. All right. Hey, Bigula. It's 2.30 a.m. What are you doing here? Yeah, what, what are you doing? 10 lines of code to make sure it works. Oh, wow. Okay, um, so technically this is an answer to the question, but you probably get marked down for not having it simplified. So now we need to take this thing and try to clean up as best we can. It's just not going to look that pretty though in general. So well, what we want to do here I think is get a common denominator between these two, because that's divided by x squared plus 9. So let's multiply that by root x squared plus 9 over root x squared plus 9. I'm also going to bring that up to the numerator. Minus 3 root x squared. Oops, let's bring the 2x in front too. So 6x. We can multiply that. To get a common denominator by root x squared plus 9 over root x squared plus 9. We still have our same denominator here. Okay. So, um, I'm going to do the next two steps at the same time. So, we're going to have. So, they have a common denominator now. So I'm going to subtract across the numerators and collapse it into one fraction. So the first part of the numerator here is 3x times x squared plus 1 minus, now the numerator part here, 6x, and then we have the square root times the square root of the same thing. So that's, uh, the square roots are, are going to go away because if you multiply like, you know, root 2 times root 2, that's just 2. For the same reason we have root x squared plus 9 times root x squared plus 9. We can call it just x squared plus 9. 
all over the common denominator, root x squared plus 9, all over <laughs> x squared plus 1 squared. These problems can get kind of tedious for reasons that you're seeing. Oh, yeah, Bio, that's... Why would you say that, Bio? Ugh. <sighs> Give me one one minute here. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. The auto mod caught the message, but th there was something that was <laughs> not good. That was written in chat, so I had to take care of that quick. Um, hey, warm-hearted American girl, are you taking questions? Yeah, uh, absolutely. If you have one, please feel free to put it in chat. Um. Compact binary logic I was doing is so tricky to logic through. Bit sauce, bit flips. Oh god, yeah, it sounds terrible, corrupt. Okay, so back to the problem. Um, oh wait, I haven't lost you completely, Curtis. Can you derive f of x? Okay, I'll do that one right after uh, this one. So Chris, I think we're nearly at the home stretch here. Um, when you have, so I I think of this as like, um, some students have taught it as like um, a b over c d is equal to a over b times d over c. We have basically the same situation here and here. There's just an invisible over one there. Like I think of like small fraction and small fraction all in a big fraction. So we're going to take this, flip it, and multiply it. So we get 3x, x squared plus 1, minus 6x, x squared plus 9, over root x squared plus 9, times x squared plus 1. Okay. Um... The only other thing I'd say that we should do here is multiply out the numerator and combine like terms. And then I think we've gotten as simple as we can make it. It's not simple, but it's simplified. We make some room here. Make another crazy arrow. So yeah, I'm going to multiply out. I'm going to distribute that 3x in here and here and the 6x here and here. The, the, the negative 6x. And then let's see where the chips fall. So we have 3x times x squared is 3x cubed. Oops, that's not cubed. That's cubed. 3x times 1 is 3x. Minus 6x times x squared is minus 6x cubed. Minus 6x times 9 is minus... 54? x? I can do math? Yeah. By the way, don't I give you another direction for the derivative? Oh, sure. You can see it's a mix of products, quotients, and powers, so you can go for logarithmic. Oh, okay. I, I probably... I, 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 it's probably the way that a calculus student is intended to do it, but you're right, you probably could do something with, with logarithms here. I just, when I was in, in calculus, though, they, they would have wanted to use the quotient rule, but 
That gets in the fight a lot if you use logs. Alright, so that's what happens when we multiply out those terms, and then the denominator is still the same here. X squared plus 1. Alright, so now let's combine like terms in the numerator, and we might get a cancellation too, we should look for that. I, d I doubt we will though. So 3x cubed minus 6x cubed is minus 3x cubed. Plus 3x minus 54x is minus 51x. Factor the 3, you get 17. So no, we don't get any cancellations if we factor things out. Plus 9, x squared plus 1. The only other thing I do to this, I guess you can factor out a negative sign. That makes it look slightly nicer to me, but you call this your final answer validly, or I could say put the negative sign in front. Do 3x cubed plus, oops. 51x over root x squared plus 9, x squared plus 1. So I probably call that my final answer. There's other forms you can write in too that don't make a significant difference. Like you could rationalize the denominator. Often people just don't do that though. So let me know if you have any questions on this, Curtis. Where you go from here is kind of a matter of preference. In other words, I'm not saying it's better. It might just be better, because you, you do get rid of a lot of this, this like, fraction math. Oh, I guess you do have to get the common denominator. Well, you don't have to, but you can. Uh, you want to see anything from Curtis in a minute? Here, I'll move on to warm-hearted American girls problem. Oh, did you get that from Wolfram, Finbox? It was restricted to 0 to pi over 2. Actually, uh, not inclusive as well. Curtis had to go? Okay. Sounds good, Windex. Th thanks for letting me know. You just worked it out? Oh, nice. Uh, unfortunately, Bio won't be here to see it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been saying some controversial things, and he crossed the line, so... <laughs> yeah. But think, uh, like, can you say at least like what your approach was? Did you do like a the triple angle and then two half angles, or like was there an easier way? You don't have to like write out your entire work if you don't want, but like, I was curious what the technique was. If Chris wants to see it too, the the the, the vod of this will publish automatically, so. Uh, the explanation will be here if uh, Curtis wants to go back to, to, to it. Alright, so when we're at American Girl, once I get erase this board, we're going to work on your problem. It'll be a bit simpler to do the, than this one. But it's a bit less like a algebra. Okay. So one more American girl, your function is one minus three x squared. Uh, x squared minus two squared. I know it's hard to do the exponents in Twitch chat. Can you tell me if I copy this down right on the board? Oh, it's cubed? Oh, okay. Thank you. So that's cubed. Let me quickly look at what Fenbox said. Sine squared x is 1 minus cosine squared 3x, which is sine squared 3x. Oh. Think about the unit circle. Okay, that's a nice approach. A lot simpler than what I was thinking. 
Oh, you're still here, Muhammad Nadeem Aziz. Um, oh my God, I'm sorry. It's so hard to keep mental track of all the questions that are being asked. Uh, frick. Okay, this is gonna gonna be a quicker problem for me to solve. That's on the board, and then I promise you, I'll do your question. Uh, because you have a more, like, general question, and, and I'm still trying to, I, I gotta think about how I'm gonna answer it, but you're right, I'm sorry, I, I should have answered your question sooner. Um. Alright, so, Walmart American Girl, I'll try and, like, get through this problem, then I'm, and then I do need to answer Muhammad's. Um. So it's gonna be, the long way to do this is to multiply everything out, and then do a bunch of individual, like, uh, exponent rules, but there's a much quicker way to do this using product rule, because you have one function here and one function here. So if you have something like this, always do product rule. It's so much uh, faster. So I usually do this in my head, but I'll kind of like draw it out. Because um, uh, I just feel like it's a nice way to like see it. We're already using F, so I'll say G is the first thing here. And uh, H is the second thing. And then G prime. Actually, I should say that the reason I'm doing this is um, the, pro the formula for the product rule is. Oh, being told to listen. Asking to move for a Q system. I've, I've been thinking about some kind of Q s system, but since I dual stream to YouTube and Twitch, it's hard to have it on one platform. <laughs> Nightbot might already be well equipped to do it. I just need to look at it. So the actual order of these aren't important. I just remember that one of these is derived, the other is normal, the other is derived, and the other one is, is, is normal, and you add them up. So we've named a g of x, we named an h of x. Let's find g prime and h prime. Um, g prime, we got to do a chain rule here. The outer function is a squared, so that exponent comes down. And then 2 minus 1 is just 1, so the next one is 1. And the uh, inside stays the same. Now we have to derive the inside. 1 minus 3x derives to minus 3. We'll simplify uh, And then let's simplify this. The minus 3 can come in front to be minus 6. 1 minus 3x. Uh, it would probably be helpful to multiply it out. Uh, no, let's, let's leave it like that. Now let's find h prime. This is another chain rule. You technically could multiply everything out again, but that's a huge pain. So let's just use chain rule. So the three comes out front. X squared minus two. Then you do three minus one is two. That's your new exponent. Now chain rule multiplied by the derivative of the inside. X squared minus two derives two X. Let's clean it up a little bit. Six uh, X, X squared minus two squared. Okay. Now let's plug into the formula because we have everything we need. So f prime of x. Uh, we said g prime h of x. So g prime is minus 6, 1 minus 3x. Uh, six x x squared minus 2 squared. Sorry, no, 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 no. g prime times regular h. x squared minus 2 cubed plus, now we're going to do h prime times g. Okay, so technically that, that's an answer, but we should clean it up. Um, I'll technically, this, this is the right answer, but it's just messy. So let, we need to factor things out. Uh, so let's look for some common terms. We have sixes. We have 1, 1 minus 3x, and we have 2, x squared minus 2s. So let's factor all of that. I'm going to factor out, I guess even, that doesn't really matter. Let's just fa factor out 6. So we have 1, x minus 3. Then we have 2, x squared minus 2s. And then what we're left with inside, we took out, we have a, ne a negative sign. We took out the 1 minus 3x. We took out almost all the x squared minus 2s. We have one left over still. Now from here, we took out a 6. Oops. We still have an x. 
then we have one x minus three left over. Um, now let's just multiply whatever's left over inside here out, combine like terms, and I'd say that we're done. Six, one minus three x, x squared minus two squared. Um, that becomes, assuming the minus sign inside, minus x squared plus two, plus x minus three x squared. Minus 3x, x squared minus 2 squared. Combine the x squared to get minus 4x squared plus x plus 2. Does that factor? That might factor. I can't tell easily. Um, dang it. Inside, wait, how is it plus x inside the square bra brackets? Oh, um, right here, I distributed the x inside here, so it was x times 1 is where the plus x came from. And the x also got multiplied by the minus 3x, to be minus 3x squared. I hope that's what, that's what your question was. I'm just going to wolfram that this is factorable, because I think the point of the problem is uh, we've done it. <laughs> um... It's not factorable. Well, it is, but it's irrational roots. I would just call that your answer. So let me have any uh, any questions. I am going to, or a, 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 any more questions. Uh, but Muhammad has been very patiently waiting, and uh, I forgot to. Uh, answer their their question so <laughs> well i, I kind of did which is why i initially de delayed it and then i forgot to answer it more, more fully so mohabin i'm sorry about that your question is can you please explain how the unit circle helps to solve trig equations yeah no problem at all warm hearted american girl so the problems that we, we were just doing on the board like sine of x equals one half that's all unit circle stuff um So I won't rehash those problems unless you want to see them. Um, let me see if I can find some other nice problems. I mean, I guess it's kind of it's kind of all the same technique. So, Mama, do you have a problem in particular you want to see? I guess because maybe I'm not clear on what more you you, you want to see. And if you have more problems with hard American Girl, please like let me know too. Um, I think Nightbot has some kind of Q system for things, and Nightbot is also on YouTube. Oh no, but it's not the same Nightbot account. Ugh. I can manage a Q myself, I guess. I probably uh yeah. So, uh, that's something to think more about. Because I, EnigmaBot could be helpful if I just add people's names to the queue myself. I don't know. PA. Oh, okay, I wasn't sure what you were saying there, Muhammad. Um, so, like, there's a problem on the screen that you want to see me do. Let me know, but if you have a problem, or like it's like a type of problem, like is this type of problem that, that you're referring to? Paul, oh no, this isn't my site, but I do love this site. It's a really nice website. Uh, I'll, I'll link you to the page that I'm looking at here. So the, the site has really nice notes. Um, GCSE, um, I think like the algebra and the algebra and trig parts, I think are GCSE level. I, I, I'm not that familiar with how those exams work though. I think it's 
like the, the calculus stuff is the main focus of the site and that's i think advanced or like i think it's beyond it um so yeah i, I guess like how, how can i best help you muhammad are having do you want to solve an equation that's like this, or do you have a different type of trig equation that's more like um, like these types? Because these you don't really use the unit circle for. These are more playing around with identities. Hey, Milk. Um, so yeah, Muhammad, I, I guess I'm just waiting to hear from you about, like, what types of problems do you want to know about? Or if thinking of this website is everything you need it, then that's cool too, but... Like, I guess I need to hear from you what you want to hear. <laughs> oh, you know, the site does have an explanation of the unit circle as well that you might find helpful. Graphs? Okay, we can definitely do graphs. Um, how should I do graphs? Ooh, it's sections on graphing isn't that good. So, let me explain how I think about graphing these. And the unit circle can definitely help with these graphs, too. Um, so, let's start with sine of x, why not? So sine and cosine are both waves. Um, so... Let's start by plugging in the values for x here and seeing what happens. So at x equals 0, well, we have sine of 0. If we look at our unit circle, that's going to come out to be 0. And I have to explain that more as well if you're confused why. Uh, if we go and plug, I'm just going to use nice unit circle values that give us 0 or, or 1 here. We could plug in any circle value we want, but I'm going to go to pi over 2, because I know that pi over 2 gives us y equals 1. I'm just going to estimate what pi over 2 is. Let's say pi over 2 is right there. And then now I'm going to plug in just pi, which I know from the unit circle is back down to 0. And if I do 3 pi over 2, we're down here at negative 1. And then if we do sine of 2 pi, that's back up to zero again. 
because 2 pi is the same thing as 0 as far as the unit circle is concerned. So what we find um, is that sine, one purity that looks like that from 0 to 2 pi. And because um, you can go as many times as you want around the unit circle, uh, sine actually ends up being periodic, and it repeats itself in both directions. You're, you're, you're allowed to go, you know, this is going um, counterclockwise around the unit circle. That's going clockwise around the unit circle. Um, So now let's go on to cosine of x, which is very similar. Um, so if we do our same process here and plug in unit circle values that give us 0 or 1, let's start with uh, 0. Uh, cosine of 0 is 1, because we're taking x values from the unit circle now. Cosine of pi over 2 is going to be 0. Cosine of pi is negative 1, so we come down here. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 uh, is 0. Then we come back around to cosine of 2 pi, where we've now repeated ourselves, we're back to cosine of 0, which is just 1 again. So one period of cosine... Oh, that's not right. <laughs> Didn't go down far enough. Looks like that. But, for the same exact reason, it's periodic. So it's going to repeat itself in both directions. And the thing to notice here is that sine and cosine are nearly the same thing. They're just offset a little bit. And that's just the way they are. <laughs> but it's uh, they are nearly the same thing. It's just kind of like an interesting thing. I'm sure there's a reason for it if you study math at a deeper level than I have. Um, the other, so this does get more advanced if you want to get into like transforming these. Uh, I'm just, we, I'm just worrying about the base forms for now, but if you want to get into transformations, just let me know. Uh, I, I'm going to do tangent next though. So tangent, I just kind of have it memorized. Um, it's a little bit harder to work out from the unit circle using the same process we did here. Um, the thing about tangent that you don't have to memorize that you can use the unit circle for is that it's uh, equal to sine over cosine. And this is a useful fact because uh, it can kind of trigger us to remember that we can't divide by 0. So we need to exclude areas where cosine is equal to 0. And if we look at the unit circle, cosine is 0. The x value is 0 on the y-axis. So cosine is going to be 0 at pi over 2 and, and um, 3 pi over 2. Um, hmm. That's kind of a weird thing with the periodicity. So... <laughs> uh, We need to exclude pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and all of their, like, you know, if you're at pi over 2, you can also go all the way around the unit circle and come back to pi over 2. So every, like, um, not multiple pi over 2, but every, like, equivalent angle of pi over 2 from the extra revolution you do around the unit circle. So let's draw some vertical asymptotes, because if you, if you divide by 0, it's like a, you, you get a vertical asymptote, basically. So x equals pi over 2, x equals 3 pi over 2. Just for demonstration, let's also go into the negatives. x equals minus pi over 2. So now that we have like our jail bars set up basically. We can never cross over the, these vertical asymptotes. 
from here, this is the part I just have, have memorized. Uh, it starts low and goes high. It levels off right by zero, and then it starts going high again. Uh, and it repeats itself, just like that. Uh, also to the left. So it has this interesting thing where it has like infinitely many vertical asymptotes to the left and right. And it has this weird kind of, it's still periodic, but it's not periodic. It doesn't look the exact same as like these up here. Uh, so I hope it's okay with you so far, Mohammed. Uh, there are three other trig functions we haven't talked about yet, which are secant, cosecant, and cotangent. And they have interesting relationships with all of these graphs. So let's switch forms. Let's also think about the graph of um, 1 over sine x, which is cosecant x. So um, we have, we have, this has vertical asymptotes, just like tangent does. And the trick to, to if we have, already have the sine graph here, we can actually build the graph of cosecant based off that graph of sine. So anywhere sine is zero, become vertical asymptotes, because you can't divide by zero, and we have one over sine here. So we get our jail bars wherever sine is zero. And looking at just this one period of sine from 0 to pi over 2, uh, the way that I remember it is it starts high, it just barely touches the top of sine x, and it comes back up. And here it starts low, just barely touches the valley there in sine x, and comes back down. And it repeats this uh, based off the peaks and valleys of sine. So that's how cosecant works. Uh, if we want to look at 1 over cosine, which is uh, secant x, it's the same exact pro uh, process. Get our GL bars over cosine is 0. And same exact thing with you know, the peak becoming a valley, the valley becoming a peak. That also repeats in the same way. And then cotangent, again, is a little bit of an, of an oddball. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same like super convenient process. I'm just going to graph it entirely separately here. It's still related to this graph, just not as visually cleanly as secant and cosecant. So. We still have our same like, kind of dynamic where wherever tangent is 0 becomes our new jail bars. So tangent is 0 at 0. Tangent is 0 over here at pi. And we'll do negative pi. Wait. Yeah. And as it turns out, we get basically the same exact shape. <laughs> that's another part I just have memorized. Oops, that's a it levels off a lot more like that. So, it, the, funny enough, the graph looks nearly the same, it's just kind of shifted. So that's my basic explanation of the graphs of the trig functions. Um, it's acting a little bit there with just memorizing how tangent looks. You can do it pretty intuitively with the, with the unit circle. Um, and I hope that helps you out, Muhammad. Uh, thank you for your patience there. Cool, sir. Uh, thank you for the, the, the question. If you, if you have anything else you want to ask about, please let me know. Underscore is saying, if you want to have a visual representation of tangent, you can draw the tangent of the unit circle, 1, 0. Set a point A in the circle, draw the line joining the origin in A. Oh. What? 
tension at the unit circle at the point one zero, set a point A on the circle, then draw the line between the origin and A. Oh, yes! You use that argument um, to prove the limit of sine x over x, right? Thales theorem, that sounds familiar. I don't remember what it says, though. Oh, yeah, this is the theorem that I was thinking of the other day with the geometry problem. Okay, I think we finally have no more questions waiting on us. Intercept theorem in English speaking. Uh, let's see. I never learned either of these. Oh, wait. Oh, this thing I learned. I remember this. Um, I'm going to use the bathroom. You only run tails? Is it pronounced tails? I was just wondering that in my head. <laughs> hey, Pen. Um, side splitter theorem? Is it a joke? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. You've seen Thales? Yeah, I've seen like definitely this version. I think the version of the circle has come up as well. And geometry problems are like on stream. But I in school I only ever learned like this thing with the parallel lines. Yeah, I'm gonna use the bathroom quick. Um since there's no more questions from chat for now, I might do some abstract studying, abstract algebra studying, speaking of, of Penn Center. Uh but I'll make my mind what's in back from the bathroom. So be right back, everyone.
Okay. Uh, did I get the mic back? Okay, good. Oh, I, uh, I'm not easily to have the song, I'm not easily able to have the song, like, a song command like that. I should really look into it. I think it's possible. The one that's been playing for the last 2 minutes and 40 seconds is After Dark by Mr. Kitty. I should look into getting that set up. Um, I think it's possible. It's just a little bit sketchy because the app I use to play the music. I mean, I guess I sometimes play it through Firefox too, so I don't know. I'll, I'll have to see if I can do it. Um, anyway, underscore says um, the triangle with parallel lines and ratios of length theorem <laughs> when studying math history of England and France in the early 20th century. Everyone wanted every math theorem to be named after someone, whether or not it was actually that person that, who discovered such proved it. So now we have a bunch of theorems with questionable names. And the name can be French was advised to be French. <laughs> oh gosh. The French just want all the glory. Yeah, it's a good song. I have this one favorited in the music player app that I use that definitely is not Spotify because that's against Spotify's terms of service, so I would never use it anyway. Um. <laughs> We're like, oh, we we're going to look at abstract algebra, I think, because I don't feel that weird about studying it now. Okay. Um, one should never use, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure you would never do, do that either, Pen Center. It's, t it's a terrible thing. Only the most heinous of people would, would ever do that. <laughs> Alright, so... I think the last I saw you do, Pen, is you were on Chapter 3. No, Chapter 2, because it starts counting from 0. All textbooks have these kind of shapes, I promise. <laughs> um, you remember the, the like weird like pattern shapes that were that I scrolled through? Oh, that scared me. Twenty-five. Uh, Ashby growls. Thanks for the follow. And anytime I get new alerts, it, they they jump scare me every time. Okay, so I, I think I've seen Penn Center do, like, I think a lot of these questions in Chapter 2. I don't know which ones exactly, but I think I need to read back through a lot of Chapter 2 here. Because I've read it off stream. I think I read it a little bit on stream, too. Oh, really? Where, where is the mistake, Fembox? Um, I... There was one problem in Chapter Zero. Oh, right, right, that one. Okay, that's, that's the one I was th thinking of. Yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> Poor President, I really got another rabbit hole of trying to, like, do it too and working through all that algebra just to find out that, oh, there actually is a solution. Okay, so... I think I'm pretty comfortable with, like, the definitions here, but let's just read through them to be safe. Binary operation, G is a set. Binary operation on G is a function that assigns each ordered pair of elements of G and an element of G. So it maps G times G onto G, to G. This is the end of chapter 2. End of chapter 2? Really? Did it just happen? I remember being the one who Googled the problem and found that there's some weird fraction. Oh, and then you found a clever way to, like, construct that fraction, too. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was chapter zero, though. Unless there's a different one. Yeah, this one right here. And then I think... 
can be a little silly wrong, but I, I know that Anders takes issue with this question here too. I should probably zoom in. I don't know how it comes across on the stream. With the book's intended solution, and uh, I think for this one being one to one is unnecessary. Okay, it, 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 it's all good. Panels. Yeah, it's really fun to find like errors in the book. It's not fun if you like you know spent half an hour trying to solve a problem that was incorrect, but. <laughs> Um, see, so we have a definition of binary operation. I'm okay with that. Oh, there, there's Anders. <laughs> uh, and then a group. They have like a hidden property here that the binary operation has to be closed. And then our I guess more formal three properties are it has to be associative, it has to have an identity, and it has to have an inverse. And interesting, the identity has to be the same in each direction, and the inverse has to be the same in each direction. Which I didn't expect to have to be true. So you can always press any integer as the difference of squares of rationals. Oh, that is a nice like generalized version of that problem. Huh. Cousin 2 is hardly special. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, now I want to be like a smart ass and wonder if that works for a equals zero. Oh, it does work. N never mind. So we're for a equals one. You get one plus two over. T yeah, it does work. Okay. Your, your, your formula is ironclad. Am I trying two examples and being too lazy to do anything else? <laughs> Uh, we can also have a special property, not necessarily to be a group, but a group could also be abelian if it's commutative. For every pair being commutative, importantly. There's even one pair that's not, then it's not. Um, and I think off stream, I read through a bunch of these examples. It was nice to figure out why we use Z for integers, I guess because of the German word for number. How do the Germans call integers then? It's, that's just the general word for... Well, what, you know what? Sometimes you have a question that needs an answer. Ganze soll? Okay. A complex number in there. <laughs> I imagine it'll work for rationals. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, too, I'm definitely too easy to check it out, though. Um... Oh yeah, there's that weird thing with multiplication. Uh, doesn't work. Because 5 has no inverse in integers. Right? These complex numbers, I don't know if those have a name. The unit complex number? I don't know. But, no, it wouldn't be the unit ones, because there'd be more than that, but... Those ones are a group under multiplication. I, I would imagine, like, the little... Um, I remember that, like, um, construction process that you gave 
for that specific example, I imagine that same construction would work for complex numbers. Oh yeah, this one isn't closed. And we're SVQ pointed out that like, it's not necessarily even associative either, but I think it's kind of a consequence of it not being closed. Two by two matrix addition is a group. I, well, I think any n by n matrix addition is a group. Or I guess even m by n. If you're talking about addition. Thanks for the work, Ben. Hang out with David for a bit. All right, enjoy. Existence of some elements that do not have inverses present prevents the set from being a group under the usual multiplication. We're grouping each case by simply throwing out the rascals. Those rascals. If A equals I, you proved I is the difference of two squares in Q of I. Really? Wait. So if A equals I, you have I plus one over two squared minus I minus one over two squared. Do those become integers? Or rationals, rather. There's no way you can express i as two rationals. Oh wait, no q i like that. I guess that's rational complex. Never mind. That's like I, I was mentioning just the set of real rationals, but I guess that q i probably means the set of. Complex numbers limited to rational numbers. I don't know. <laughs> um, our star of non-zero real numbers is a group under ordinary multiplication. Fair enough. Oh yeah, general linear group and special linear group. General linear is determinant not equal to zero. Oh. oh, excuse me. Then special linear is determined equal to one in particular. Oh yeah, this one, I remember this example being kind of hard to wrap my head around. Integer A is multiplicative inverse modulo N if and only if A and N are relatively prime. Like that fact took me a long time to come to terms with. <laughs> and part of the justification was from one of the exercises. Uh, in chapter zero, I think. Yeah, and one of the exercises they had you prove ax mod n equals one if and only if um, a and n are relatively prime. Yeah, so I I, I want to rewrap my head around this one, I guess, because like I feel like everything should just always have a multiplicative inverse, but evidently not. Oh. So we specifically define this U of N group to 
leave out anything that's not relatively prime so we can have guarantee that inverses exist. Bezu theorem? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we, we talked about Bezu before. I forget what it says, though. Wait, wasn't it Bezu Lemma? I don't... That seemed like something else. Bezu's Ligma? A and B be integers with greatest common divisor D, then there is integers X and Y such that AX with B by equals D. Oh, okay, the linear combination thing. Uh, if you're working mod 6, what is the solution to the 2x equals 1? Like 2x mod 6 equals 1? Well, those aren't relatively prime, so there is no solution, right? Because you're always mod 2 force or 0. Mod six. Or you're always six. like, you know, 6 mod 6. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's like just like coming to terms with that actually. Like I, I get the two facts separately, I guess, but it's like thinking about how they're the same thing. It always like I have to think about it separately. Okay, that, that's a good example. Like Fenbox, just to like give me something to <laughs> reason through. All right, and this is where they. Oh no, that's where I explain what mod is. Never mind. And so, okay, so what is the identity? Well, the identity is just one because we're talking about multiplication, and you can look at the Cayley table and see that one always gives you the same thing back. Um, it being like mirrored diagonally means that it's abelian, which makes sense because multiplication is commutative. Two and six not being co primes, meaning there's no solution, means there's no unique solution. Oh, right, to two mod six in general. Or 2x mod 6. So, well, if it's 2x mod 6 equals, or 2x mod 6 equals 0, has infinitely many solutions, right? Every multiple of 3? Oh, two is not a unit in mod six. I, I missed that, that that message. Two is not a unit mod six. Does being a unit mean that there's a solution to two x equals one? Oh, you, okay, wait, you said that 2 is not a unit. It means that it's not something that will be included in our group. Okay. So, like, the, the units of 10, or the, the units mod 10 are 1, 3, 7, and 9. That, I guess that's what you mean. Okay. Is a unit in the mod, but not 6? <laughs> The absolute unit.
It's also 90 degrees. <laughs> hey, Obi. Uh, Jed is the absolute unit, apparently. It's also perpendicular. Oh, he's also right. I get it. Jed is always right. AKA Jed is always 90 de degrees. Depends what you are solving over. If it's over Z, it could be infinite. If it's Z and Z. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, because if you're already in mod 6 world, the only things you're allowed to use are... 0 through 5. So when you say it only has two solutions, we'd say x equals 0 and x equals 3. Get you 0 mod... or, you know, congruent to 0 mod 6, I think is what you're saying. Okay. And if you're working over all integers, then you have more... solutions. It's actually every angle. Mrs. Jet thinks he's acute. Don thinks he's 90 degrees when it comes to new math. I'm quite a bit over 90. Obtuse. <laughs> Ugh. Okay, so I don't know if there's more kind of real visions we can glean from example 11, but maybe we'll move on for, for now. Blur book? Der Algebra? Probably saying that horribly wrong. Set 0, 1, 2, 3 is not a group under multiplication mod 4. 2 and 0 causal issues. Yeah. So I think we're talking about multiplication, even if it's mod, our identity is always going to be 1. Um, and so yeah, nothing times 0 will get you 1. And if you're working mod 4, nothing times 2 will get you 1. Okay. So there's an abstraction on group since it's not associative, right? You can always just allow... You can always just consider only addition and think about negative integers, though, if you want to get around that. Complex numbers are a group under addition. And I assume you need C star to be a group under multiplication. Oh, are they about to... Yeah, okay, no, never mind. <laughs> they see that right there. Negative integers addition not a group either? Really? Why not? Oh, you have to exclude zero. No? Or, oh yeah, zero doesn't have a unique no. The identity is zero. What's causing the issue? I think it's associativity holds. The in zero is its own inverse, I think. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's closed. What's the last condition? Associative? Identity and inverse.
Oh, I, I don't mean only negative. If that, that's, a, that's what we're saying. Underscore. I mean, uh, if you have all integers with addition, you can construct subtraction, like inside that group, basically, or you know what we would want to be subtraction. Is, is, is that what you're saying? Negative integers with addition is in a group. Right. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I probably, I didn't phrase it right. But what I was thinking is, if you can't make a group out of integer subtraction, you can still accomplish the same thing as subtraction. If you do an addition, which is a group with negative integers, but I, I still mean you're talking about all integers. You just um, also include negatives. Wait, underscore. Are are, are you talking about? exclusively negative integers or all integers because the book is saying directly that integers is under a group under is a group under addition and i, I think if you were talk talking about multiplication i would agree with you ob because two negatives multiplied makes a positive Oh yeah, uh, uh, underscore. I I mean the set of all integers with addition. I agree. He's consider only the the negative integers with or without zero. That's certainly not a group under addition or m multiplication. Z plus is a group. What's the inverse? Oh wait, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm misinterpreting you now. I missed over you again. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, Muhammad. Jed is never negative. He is, after all, an absolute unit. Nice. I think Jed is doing slash me. Jed always speaks in italics as part of his sharp. <laughs> uh, closure. It's closure is a weird thing because. It's not denoted as a property in this list, or like a necessary property, but it is necessary to be a binary operation. Uh, because a group requires a binary operation, and a binary operation requires closure. Unless I'm misinterpreting why you're saying closure do doesn't matter. Never gonna leave Muhammad. All right, probably not gonna go for a ton longer. Anyways, you know that that long to, to to wait me out for. But thanks for hanging out. That's why when you start learning groups, your teacher might force you to always specify the law you're talking about. Because if you change the law, you might have a group or not, or like what set, or the operation. All right, and then this Roots of Unity thing. I did this one, or I did it on my head off stream. Um, this one is related to the set from earlier, if you take n equals four. The set from earlier is this one.
Uh, I have never heard it called a law for binary operation. Then again, I've only barely studied algebra. When I first learned definition of group from a different author, he had four conditions with group rather than three equation. Yeah, it's just like it is implied by this, but he only says it explicitly right here. So if you're just skimming, it's pretty easy to miss. Um, that, you know, in practicality, you have to check it like it's in any other condition down here. I, I think this is probably the more formal way to construct it, because I... Um... I assume that binary operations are used in other contexts and that you need the closure there too. But I don't know, maybe you can also have a fourth property for closure too. Uh, the chat does stay. It'll be there forever. L I, I, I'm going to try to pronounce it because I think it's fun to butcher French words. L loi? L L I'm going to say loi. loi. I feel like that's not how you do it, though. Loi de composition in turn? Inner composition law. Then the composition of functions. But you know terminology sucks sometimes. How <laughs> do you pronounce LOI? Google Translate, lady, save me. Oh, good. Thank you for translating to German. Lua. Okay. Lua. Okay. Composition. Or com okay, I, I mean, I guess I should do the entire thing. I'm sure I didn't pronounce composition the right way. What the? <laughs> this entire part of the phrase, I feel like she, she just like. Went, <laughs> I don't know how to say the last part. <laughs> that doesn't sound like words to me. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> okay, one more time. Loi de composition in the. I don't know. That sounds super weird to me. French makes... Cause I, 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 I don't know French. The pronunciation makes no sense to me. <laughs> also why it's fun to try to pronounce it anyway, though, I guess. It's all looks and sounds so complicated. <laughs> All right, so yeah, vector addition is a group. It's fair enough. Composici on entirn. Okay. Entirn. Um... Teach me your ways. <laughs> Fail a million times, and then eventually you might have a hope of getting it right. <laughs> Until you learn math. Basically, I know our stops on a lot of French phrases. Yeah, I guess that's what trips me up. It kind of like blends together. So yeah, there's a special linear group, which is specifically with determinant 1, which gives some nice extra properties.
Hey, Cha Cooks Chilies. Uh, you're in middle school. You have tests tomorrow. I don't understand a question. Uh, feel free to ask it. You can put you can put it right there in chat if you want. Seven special linear groups. Right. The inverse is simpler because whenever AD minus BC is one. Matrix entry from ZP, we use modulo P arithmetic to compute determinants, matrix products, and inverses. Right. This was a weird thing for me. Okay. And I see you put that equation in there. What's the task to do with that, Cha? It's like a parabola in vertex form. How do I factor and identify the zeros? Okay. So... <laughs> There's potentially two ways to go about this. I'll show the easier way. I assume it's the way that you're intended to do it. Um, there is a harder way to do it, that if your teacher is being obtuse might require you to do it. I'll show the way that I hope that you're supposed to do it, though. Because factoring, um, you can find the zeros of that without factoring that, as I think of factoring, at least. And maybe the definition of factoring is big enough to accommodate, but... I'll explain more what I mean when we actually like, dig into the problem, though. Um, y equals 2x minus 3 squared minus 18. Let me make sure I'm copying that down right. 2 times x minus 3 squared minus 18. Thanks for, for the work, OB. Oh, and have a good night. Okay, so you want to factor it and identify the zeros. I'm going to start by identifying the zeros, and I'll explain more why at the end. Um, so if we want to find the zeros, we take y and we set it equal to zero. I like doing it this way because we can solve it pretty directly without having to do too much extra work. And I suspect you may be supposed to do this a different way, which I'll show too. <laughs> uh, but we can actually solve this if we add 18 to each side. We get 18 equals 2 times x minus 3 squared. Now we can divide each side by 2 to cancel that out. So we'll get 9 equals x minus 3 squared. And if I'm going too fast for you, please let me know. Um, now we have a squared here that we want to get rid of. So we can square root each side. But when you square root each side, you need to add a, a plus or minus because it's just the way that square roots work. I can explain it more if you want, but that's just the rule to, to remember. Um, now the square root of 9 is 3. So let's say it's plus or minus 3 is equal to x minus 3. Now let's add 3 to each side, and we'll get two solutions. 3 plus or minus 3 is equal to x. So we'd say the zeros of the parabola are 3 plus 3, which is 6, and 3 minus 3, which is 0. And then... Um, if you want to get in factored form, we can actually figure it out just based off the roots here. So the kind of pattern that you can remember is it's always x minus the root times x minus the other root. So this is what I have to look in factored form, but you can make it look a bit cleaner because x minus zero is just x. So you have x minus six times x, and that x can come out front to make it a little bit more familiar looking. 
So like, I would call that the factored form. So this is a backwards, backwards way to do it. I can, like I said, you, you probably intended to do it a different way. I think this way is easier if you're already given it in this form. But let me know if this makes sense to you, or um, if I don't see anything soon, I'll explain the other way to do it. Beware the leading coefficient. Did I make a mistake here? Underscore? No, 0 and 6 are definitely the... Uh... Oh! Wait. I see. Oh my god, we do need a 2 here. Okay, you know what? Maybe don't do it this way, because I just made a mistake doing it, so what if you make a mistake doing it? You do need a 2 there, don't you? Because you have a 2 up there. Uh, yeah, okay, so they gave a bit of a harder case. Actually, it's maybe you're supposed to do it this way. You're supposed to know the two is there. Um, I'll show it a separate way, too, because I did just make a mistake doing it this way. If you do know that, I think this is the easier way. Should there be two in front of the X? Yeah, Cha. I, 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 I think I saw that late. Uh, when you sent that message, but you're right. There, when there's a leading coefficient with the with the parabola, it, it, it's always it always makes things har harder for me. But uh, yeah, if we do con construct it out of the zeros again, we do need to make sure that leading coefficient carries carries through. And so yeah, Jed, the the, the other way is by pulling this out. So you could also instead of doing it this way, you could try to figure out the factored form first rather than doing the zeros first. So I'll show that that way as well. So if you want to go from this form to this form, you need to multiply all the stuff out. It's a, a bit more algebra, but it can be done. I'll come over here and do it. So instead of saying x minus 3 squared, I'll rewrite it as x minus 3 times x minus 3. That's the same thing as squaring it, but it's a bit easier to work with it in this form. And so, I want to multiply x minus 3 by x minus 3. And when we do that, um, I always thought the FOIL acronym, I can remember how to apply it though. <laughs> uh, before anything else, let's make sure the 2 carries over. We're not going to deal with the 2 yet. We're just dealing with x minus 3 and x minus 3. So 2 and then inside parentheses. I take the first, I'm going to multiply it by each of these. So I'll start with x times x is x squared. x times negative 3 is minus 3x. Now we take the second term and multiply each of them also. So negative 3 times x is minus 3x. And negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Minus 18. Um, now let's combine like terms. So I see we have a minus 3x and a minus 3x. Let's combine those. Uh, and now let's deal with the 2. Let's multiply this inside everything by distributing it. 2x squared minus 12x plus 18. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Minus 18. Okay, so <laughs> conveniently, uh, we had 2 times 9 is 18. And then we have a minus 18 right there. So plus 18 minus 18 is going to be 0. So we end up with 2x squared minus 12x. And this can be factored. Um, and we look at what these have in common. They have a 2 in common, because 6 times 2 is 12. And they have an x in common. So let's factor out a 2x. So that's what they have in common. So we get 2x, and then what we're left over with, we took away 2x from that 2x squared. So we just have an x left over. And then this is minus 12x. We took away a 2x, so the x is completely gone, and the 12 gets divided by 2. So it's minus 6. So it was minus 12, so minus 6. So you can see it's the exact same thing there now that we've, we've now matched. And then from this, you can set it equal to 0 and find your zeros. This way that I think your teacher might intend you to, 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 to do it, but it kind of depends. Uh, you get the same answer either way, but from this you would split it off into two equations. 2x equals 0. 
and x minus 6 equals 0. So x equals 0 or x equals 6. Two different ways to get the same answers. Let me know if you have any questions on that. Oh, thanks for doing the save there, Jed. Can you explain logarithmic and exponential graphs? Um, sure, Raheem. Or sorry, uh, a, a, a man, Raheem. No worries, Cha. Thanks for, 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 for the question. Um, so logarithmic and exponential graphs. I think I should announce it a few times. I've said it before on stream, but um, I think I'm going to do a math stream tomorrow because I'm going to be busy on Saturday during my normal stream time. So I might do some kind of Saturday night gaming thing or I might just take Saturday off. But tomorrow, instead of the gaming, I'll probably be doing math. Okay. So, Amon, I'm probably saying that wrong, but um, you want to explain, or you want to hear about logarithmic and exponential graphs, only see what underscore is saying. If the Asker has been introduced by Jodic's period, there's a chance teacher wants to think in terms of remarkable identities. Uh, maybe. I don't know how you'd apply it here or to that problem. Uh, mom it out. I'll go for as long as I'm feeling. Okay, so. Actually, let me just walk into an exponential graphs. Okay. So, the 30 second thing that I would convey to you, which I'll explain it more. But, um, if, you're, if you just ask about the graphs of, expo of exponential functions and log functions, the thing that I would just have memorized while wow, this marker is dying on me. Oh, I wonder if I have blue, blue ink if I already used it. How's the black marker doing? An exponential graph always looks vaguely like this. And if you remember your function inverses, which most I think most students have learned about inverse functions by now. You reflect it across the line. Actually. Actually, no, I think it's okay. You reflect it across the line y equals x, this like diagonal line. So a, a log graph looks like that. That's how the two graphs are related. That's kind of like the easy thing I can most quickly co convey to you. But let's go a bit more like in depth. Hey, uh, Skinny Combs, Windex, how, how's it going? Oh, was it different? Wow, I was never taught to do it like that underscore. I guess that's also possible. Um, so if, you have, if you're given something to actually plot, um, or, you know, if you have... Uh, exponentials are normally in the form like y equals a times b to the x. And we might give you actual numbers for a and b. Um, I'm trying to remember, actually, I'm trying to remember how this works for myself. So if you have y equals, let's say... 3 times 2 to the x. The 2 to the x is kind of like... I, I call that like the important part because it involves x. The 3 is just going to be kind of like transforming the graph in some way. So if you want to get like a big graph for this, let's try a few values for x here and make a little chart. So I would say... Um, 
let's do like negative one, zero, one, and two as relatively easy things to plug in. Um, I'll start with zero because the negative one will actually be a little bit weirder to do. If you have zero, you have two to the zero is one because anything to the power of zero is one times three is just so three times one is just three. Uh, if you plug in x equals one, you get two to the one is just two. Three times two is six. If you plug in two, it'll be two squared is four. Four times three is 12. And if you do negative one, I'll show this one out separately. Uh, an exponent of negative one is the same thing as flipping the two to the bottom. So it's like three times a half which we can just say is 3 over 2. We can know it's 1 and a half. So now we have a couple of points, and knowing the general shape of an exponential graph, we can now, you know, get, get some kind of graph. And then I'm going to make these tick marks, I guess. 4, 5, 6. I guess we'll go by 2s for our tick marks. So I don't have to make a giant graph here. So at negative one, we have three over two. So just eyeballing it, uh, three over two is one and a half. So it'll be just below two. Uh, X equals zero, we have three, which is right there. X equals one, we have six, which is right there. And X equals two, we have 12, which is right there. So you can see this kind of generally sh uh, fits the shape of an exponential graph. So we probably didn't do anything wrong in our arithmetic here. So now we just trace it. That's kind of like the general process I'd use to uh, uh, graph an exponential. Uh, and if you want to do a logarithm, uh, they're a bit more annoying to work with, with plugging in helpful values of x, but you certainly can. Uh, let's look at y equals I don't know, let's just say 5 times log base 2 of x. I'm using 2 as my base because it's going to be related to this 2. Actually, let's, let's do these with the uh, eh, it's fine. We'll just do 5. Just any random number in front. Make another xy chart. Uh, so the important thing to remember with logs is you're not allowed to plug in zero to a log or a negative number. So just not allowed. So I'm going to start with x equals 1. Uh, we can do x equals 2. And since I know some experience with logs, I'm going to keep my life a little bit easier and do 4 next reason that we'll see once we actually start plugging in 4. So if we want to plug in 1 here, uh, y equals 5 times log base 2 of 1. Well, log base 2 of 1, we figure what that out is. What, what that is. Uh, it might be a bit more clear if we put it into exponential form. So log base 2 of 1 is basically asking 2 to what power, uh, I'll call it b, is equal to 1. And just looking at this, if b equals 0 here, we know things to the power of 0 come out to be 1. So what the log gives us is that exponent right there. So log base 2 of 1 is equal to 0. So that means it's 5 times 0, which is just 0. So plug in 1, we get 0 for our log. Uh, feel free to put your question in chat, Cha. Do you guys think it's possible to learn all the material for a calc test in about seven hours when I have not been able to show up to class once? Uh, if you can, you're some kind of genius. You can probably learn how to take the integral of things in that time. Maybe the conceptual understanding of what an integral actually is would probably take longer. 
you could learn the basics of integration that quick, though, I think. Um, all right, continue with this log graph. If you plug in two, log base two of two, well, if you look at the same kind of situation here, so we have two here, uh, a number to the power of one will give itself back. So two to the one equals two, which means log base two of two is one, because the log is always the exponent. Uh, oops, sorry. The log is one, and then we multiply by the five. So it's five times one is equal to five. Now there's one more. If we have log base two of four, well, two squared is four, or, you know, two to the power of two is four. So log base two of four is two. Two times five is 10. So now we've got a couple of points, and knowing the general shape of a log, let's grab it. Uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. I'll go by twos again because I'm lazy. Uh, so we have one, zero. We have two, five. We have four, ten. Then we know what the rest of the shape is like. So we go like that. So I guess that's my quick explanation of how you graph logs. It comes with the shapes, but you trick with finding out the ranges and equations such as y equals a log b c plus d. So you back when you need help. I don't know if I'll be streaming for them some longer juice, but if you can catch me, then sure. Do you do word problems? Uh, yeah, word problems can sometimes be tricky, but I should be able to do it. The increasing shape of the exponential function base b comes from b greater than one. Oh, true. I, I I won't get into that yet, though. Um, can you give me tips on how to find out the range? Especially when it's transformed. So the nice thing about logs, if you want the range of, of any log function, uh, logs... No matter how you transform a log, even if you have y equals 5 times log base 2 of 12x minus 3 plus 4. If you have something crazy like that, your range is always uh, all real numbers or negative infinity to positive infinity, depending on how you express things. Um, a log will always go infinitely down and infinitely up. The infinitely up part is kind of slow, like it looks like it levels off, but it never actually does. It will eventually get all the way up, like, you know, past the, the, the whiteboard. So for the range of a log, it's always all real numbers. Now for an exponential, it's a little bit different. Because this really does bubble off at y equals zero. So for exponentials, we'd say it's between like zero and infinity, or y is greater than zero. There's a couple different notations and ways to express it. Uh, and these are inverse of each other, so like their domains and ranges are also switched. So in the same way that a log, you can never get, uh, it, the same way a log is always greater than zero, you can never, the domain, or sorry, the range of an exponential is always greater than zero, and the domain of a log is always greater than zero. You can't plug in zero or negative number into a log. And that's because they're inverse of each other. Like, they're they're related in that way. Oh wow, we got the Calvary kit coming out here on YouTube. Um, well, but I told I told you I'll take a break when I want to take a break. I don't need you to tell me. Hey, Ronnie. Do you have a couple of stuff tomorrow? Looking for all the videos on YouTube, and I found you. Awesome. I don't know if I'm going to be streaming for a ton longer, but if you have a question, let me know. Domain of a logarithmic. Oh, okay. Um, 
and chalk cooks chilies. I see how to solve that. Yeah, uh, we're gonna want vertex form. Um, I'll solve that after I finish with a man's question here. Range of domain? No worries. So find the domain. That's a good question. We we'll use the crazy example that I just showed here. So the thing, if you want to find the domain of a log, um, you only worry about where you're plugging into the log here. So you're not, oops, uh, I feel like I had to sneeze, but it's not coming. So like I said, you're not allowed to have log of zero or a negative number. So anything inside of the log, you want to be greater than zero. So if you want to work out the domain of this, you take what's inside the log and you set it to be greater than zero. And then you solve this inequality for x. So let's add three to each side. We'll get 12x is greater than three. Then divide each side by 12. Oops. And we get x is greater than 3 over 12. And if you cancel out the 3, you get x is greater than 1 fourth. So that's your do domain right there, depending on the class. They might prefer an interval notation, which would look like this. If you haven't seen this before, don't worry about it. But um, I think that's probably more likely what you're supposed to give as your answer. Yeah, that same process can be used for any log you want. You just take the inside part and set it greater than zero. If you have any questions on that, I'll switch over to Chalk Hook's Chili's questions. Awesome. I'll start erasing the top part, but I'll check chat again before I erase the rest. Actually. Okay. All right, yeah, I'm erasing it. All right, so you got... Does f of f inverse of x equal x? Yes. That's the definition of an inverse, uh, actually. So you can be sure that's always true, I guess. OK. Minus 16 t squared. plus 50t plus 4. Okay. So, uh, chalk hooks. Um, if we want to find the maximum height of the acrobat here, we need to use a helpful fact about parabolas, which is a parabola always looks like this, or it always looks like that. And whether it opens up or opens down depends on the leading coefficient, if it's positive or negative. Here we have a negative leading coefficient because it's a negative 16. So we have this situation where it's facing down. And the nice thing here is that the vertex is also the maximum. And we know how to get things into vertex form, so that's going to be the key here to, to, to the problem. So we don't even need to graph this thing exactly. We just need to know that it's facing down and that we want the, the vertex. We don't need to, to do anything more with the graph. Um, so really the task here is to get into vertex form and then um, the value for k, like whatever the y-coordinate of the, the vertex is, will be our height. So if we want to get into vertex form, we need to complete the square on this. And completing the square with the leading coefficient is always annoying. Um, what I'm going there's different ways that you can do this. I tend to get mixed up if I don't factor the minus 16 out at the start. <laughs> Uh, the four can stay on the outside. 
But I'm going to, from these two terms, I'm going to factor out negative 16. 50 divided by 16 is going to be a fraction, and I'm just going to be okay with that. So, um, 50 over 16, t, and then on the outside, plus 4. Um, let's simplify this fraction as well. So they have a 2 in common for sure. So you get 25 over 8, and that's as much as we can do. All right. So now when we complete the square, we want to do... Um, I believe it's b over 2a squared is our formula, where that's b and that's a, but I've engineered so a is 1, because I factored the 16 out. So b is 25 over 8. So uh, 25 over 8 over 2 squared. Let's deal with a fraction of a fraction business first. Um, you may have seen the formula like a, b over c over d equals, you flip the bottom and you multiply it, a, b times d over c. We do the same thing here and just treat it as 2 over 1. So we'll flip 2 over 1 and multiply it in with that. 25 over 8 times a half squared. So you multiply across the numerator, multiply across the denominator, you get 25 over 16 squared. So isn't it easier to get stationary point through differentiation? Uh, yeah, if you know calculus, but um, the person is doing this without cal cal calculus eight, a month. Uh, transferred 5k to me on Twitch? Oh, you're not being annoying, Muhammad, but I don't know what you mean with that. Um, we have time. Can you explain how to determine the curve? Concave up and concave down, I find the points of inflection, how to sketch it. Yeah, sure, Ronnie. After this question, I'll do that. Hmm. These are kind of annoying numbers to work with. Um... I also want to make sure that I'm not doing something wrong with the whole completing the square thing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm right, though. Uh, this part, this exact thing, it kind of like trips me up, even though it really shouldn't. So I, there, it, there's always a possibility that I need to back up and correct my work. For now, let's keep it going. So this whole b over 2a squared thing is so we know we need to do a plus and minus of the same thing. And that's what the b over 2a squared is. I'm not even going to bother squaring it yet. We don't have to square it, at least yet. So I did plus 25 over 16 squared, minus 25 over 16 squared. So I haven't really changed the problem because it adds to zero. And you're allowed to add zero to things. Uh, that should be t plus that. T's and pluses are always very easy to get mixed up. T plus. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this. And this is engineered, so it'll be a perfect square. Uh, and kind of the pattern is going to be, it'll be T match that sign there minus the square root of that. 25 over 16 squared. Um, I actually need brackets here, don't I? Because we still have this thing that we didn't include. And let me uh, just verify that little part to make sure I didn't screw up my... <laughs> Minus B over 2A. Um, I 
Oh, you know what? That might just shortcut the thing that I did. I think my... I ended up with a minus B. Like, that's my 25 over 16. Uh, that's in the last line there. I, I, I think I did it the long way compared to how you were taught. Uh, in Windex, you're saying you, you want the extrema in the inflection points. Uh, yeah, you're second in line after Ronnie. But I, I can definitely do that question. Harrison Cambridge, IGS, IGCSE, Ad Math Questions, Papers. Uh... I've never seen that. I'm sorry. Amen. Yeah, so, um... Oh, yeah. Thank you, uh, underscore. Uh, we, we did do the same thing, chalk hooks. I just did it the long way, because I don't remember... <laughs> uh... I don't like to memorize formulas that I don't have to. But if you understand how, how to get to that last line, then I think we're good. Uh, I'm just verifying my work here. Okay, good. I did complete the square, right? So we're nearly in vertex form. So this minus 25 over 16 squared is causing issues. So I'm going to distribute the 16 to this and distribute the 16 to this. So minus 16 times t minus 25 over 16 squared. Then minus 16 times minus that turns to plus 16 times 25 over 16 squared plus 4. So now we're basically in vertex form. Like, this matches the format, but we should simplify this number into one thing. But other than that, it, it, this does match the format for, for, for vertex form. And that was the main goal of this. Okay, so here. Uh, let me do it step by step. Oh, I'm being told to listen. Oh, hey, Curtis. Okay, no, it's just a meme. Hey, listen. Oh, uh, not at the end yet, Cha, but if you understand the problem for, from here, then I can leave you to it. Julian, do you, any, do, you do any physics stuff? Um, I don't. Um, there are people on twitch.tv who do. I'm not good with it. physics for myself, though. Um, those are the two people who I would recommend for physics there. Okay, so if you have 20 over 16 in parentheses squared, it's the same thing as 25 squared over 16 squared. I think like distributing the exponent to each thing is 4. And now 16 can cancel with 16 squared. You just get a 16 on the bottom. Twenty-five squared. I just know that six twenty-five. You may need a calculator for that. I mean to do it like separately. Uh, if you don't have that memories like I do. Okay. Now we just need to get these a common denominator, and we're done. Or and yeah, and, and we're done with the problem. <laughs> twenty-five over sixteen squared. All right. So we're gonna multiply six twenty-five over sixteen. We want to multiply 4 by 16 over 16, so that has a common denominator. So, something over 16. 4 times 16 is uh, 64. Nearly there. Uh, 625 plus 64. They have common denominators, so we can add the numerators. Um, is 689. All right. Does that simplify? One, no, two, four, and eight. Don't go into that. Okay. 
So I'd say the final answer here is that it reaches that for the maximum height with the y coordinate of the vertex. The x coordinate is time, the y coordinate is height. So 689 over 16. It's quite the problem right there. Uh, Ezekiel Art, who do you recommend for physics? Um, welcome in, by, by the way. I recommend actual education, and I recommend physics and depression. Those are the only two people who I'm aware of who do physics on Twitch. All right, see you, Muhammad. Oh, awesome, Amon. Th thanks for, for, for joining. All right, so yeah, uh, Chocolate, so let me know if you have any question on, questions on that. Um, no worries. <laughs> okay, so... Who else do we have? So Ronnie asked that question. Ronnie, are you still here? I, I can move on to yours now. Oh, thanks for the follow, Ezekiel. Then after Ronnie, we have Windex. You are here. Okay, awesome. So Ronnie, you want to know where x cubed minus 3x plus 1 is concave up and concave down, the points of inflection, and how to sketch it. Oh, there are multiple Windex, aren't there? Skinny columns. I, I think it was you who asked the question, right? Yeah. Okay, so I am doing Ronnie's problem first, and then you're up next. Um... Okay. So y equals x cubed minus three x plus one. All right. So points of inflection. In any of your points of inflection or concavity, you should think second. Der derivative, so let's go right to the second der derivative here. So first, let's do the first derivative, of course. Uh, so y prime, let's use the power rule, x cubed derives to 3x squared. 3x derives to just 3, 1 derives to 0. So I say our first derivative here is 3x squared minus 3. They're not asking for minima or maxima though, so I think we can keep moving right along to the second der derivative. We don't do anything with this. So y double prime is 3x squared derives to 6x, 3 derives to 0. So if you want to find points of inflection, which I think is a good thing to start with, we set the second derivative equal to 0. So 6x equals 0. Divide each side by 6, you get x equals 0. So we have an inflection point at x equals 0. Um, depending on your professor or your teacher, they might want you to get the actual xy pair. So you have to plug 0 back in up here, which we can do. 0 minus 3 times 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. So we'd say our point of inflection is 0, 1. Um, so the concavity, this is where uh, people often make a sign chart, which we can do here. So based on our x values, uh, we put our point of inflection there. And then we plug in test values on either side into our second derivative to determine concavity. 
So to the left of zero is anything less than zero. Let's take the easiest one I can think of, negative one. Negative one times six is negative six. The important part is that it's negative. So over here, we're concave down. If you plug in a positive number like one, you get six times one is positive six. So to the right, uh, we're concave up. Um, cubics are a little tricky to sketch. So in order to sketch it, so the issue with cubics is that <laughs> uh, they can look like this or they can look like that. Um, I think it's going to end up looking like this, but if we want a better sketch, we should actually use the first derivative here to figure out the minimum and maximum. So let's, let's do, do that too so we can get a decent sketch. Uh, so if we set this equal to zero, uh, let's divide, well, we can factor out three. x squared minus one is a difference of two squares which is 3 times x plus 1 times x minus 1 equals 0. So we get minima and maxima at positive 1 and negative 1. So I'd say now we have, well, the word sketch is subjective. We can figure out what 1 and negative 1 go with on the graph and get actual points. I guess, I guess let's do that. If we plug in positive 1, we get 1 minus 3 is negative 2, plus 1 is negative 1. So one, negative one. And does that make sense? I think it does. <laughs> does it? Yes, okay, okay. Uh, if you plug in negative one, you get negative one plus three is four, plus one is five. Um, I say now we definitely have enough information to sketch it. So, like one, two, three, four, five, minus one. Okay, plus one, minus one. Okay, so let's sketch. We know that zero one is our inflection point. Zero one is right there. We have a critical point at one negative one, uh, right there. We have another critical point at negative one five. What kind of cubic is this? Did I do something wrong? I did. Negative one. No, I. Ne negative one plus three is two. Plus one is three. That makes it a little more reasonable. I feel like I still did something wrong. I'm expecting the cubic to look like this because of the positive leading coefficient. Oh, yeah. No, we're okay. <laughs> so, to the left of zero, we're concave down. Uh, so it's opening down, and it reaches, as it turns out, a maximum there. And then right... So for this entire part, it's concave down, and then right here at the inflection point, it changes back around to concave up. So that I think that that's my sketch. Should I sketch the thing when you drew first? Okay. All right, I don't know which one you mean first now, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure that sketch is right. So uh Sherlock quadratic formula? I guess so, yeah.
So, Ronnie, do, does that not match? I'm graphing it in a uh, graphing calculator now. No, this matches. More or less. I mean, it does it a lot more exact than I do, but this is the, the right shape. So yeah, Sherlock, if you want to put the question in chat, uh, please go ahead and do so. We saw that one from um, Columns Windex, Skinny Columns Windex. And I may say that Sherlock's question is the last one for the day, so I'm starting to get tired. Teacher probably did it wrong. Oh, maybe. Yeah, if it looks like, um... If it looks like this, it's definitely wrong. Um... Yeah, like, this is a very specific type of cubic. Normally, they look something like this. All right. So skinny columns, Windex. That's what you. Oh yeah, that. I mean, maybe your teacher was drawing like you know that basic version of cubic, but the graph of the cubic in that problem it's definitely like the the right curve. Um. So skinny columns, Windex wants to determine the local and global extrema points and the points of inflection for the cube root of x cubed minus 2x squared plus 1. Okay, we can do this. x cubed minus 2x plus 1. Interesting function. I don't know how this looks on a graph. We don't... Oh wait, 2x squared. Okay. Uh, the next stream will be tomorrow. Can you find the quadratic form QB obtained by rotating QA counterclockwise through an angle of 5 pi over 6? Oh, I don't know how you rotate a function like that, Lucas. I'm sorry. I haven't done a problem like that before. All right, so we want the extrema and um, local and absolute. And uh, local and global. No worries. Yep, same format of stream. Normally, I, I don't do it on Fridays, but my schedule this week is a little bit weird. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to keep up with the chat. Okay, local and global extrema points of inflection. All right, so let's work on the extrema. Uh, for, for those, we just want y prime. So this is going to be some chain rule stuff. Um, I will rewrite the original function as, instead of a cube root, let's write it as a power of one third, because that kind of helps us vi visualize the power rule here. So we're going to have to do a chain rule on the outside one third power and then on the inside cubic. So start with the one third power. Power rule, so you subtract, you, you bring the power out front and you subtract one, wait. I'm getting, okay. Bring the power out front, subtract one from the power. So <laughs> one third comes out front. 
the inside stays the same. And then up here, you, subtract, you do one third minus one is negative two thirds. Uh, now, chain rule, multiply by the derivative of the inside. x cubed derives to 3x squared. Uh, minus 2x squared derives to minus 4x. 1 derives to 0. So let's clean this up a little bit. Uh, that's a negative exponent, so it can go down to the denominator. Uh, this stays on top, so... The three comes from the, or the one third becomes a three here. There. So I think that's our cleaned up first der derivative. Uh, so if we want the uh, extrema here, we have to set equal to zero. Now, this looks like a horrible mess to solve for zero. Think that when you just have a fraction like this, you can work only with the numerator. Because the denominator will never give you a solution of zero here. So we can boil this problem down to 3x squared minus 4x equals zero. Just the top part. So if the numerator is zero, the entire thing is zero. If the denominator is zero, then you break math. Uh, and that's not allowed. <laughs> so from this boiled down problem, let's factor out an x. Get 3x minus 4 equals zero. Uh, from this, you get x equals 0 and 4 thirds. So these are extrema. We don't know minimum, maximum, global, or local yet. Determining global is going to be hard when we don't know how the graph of this looks. <laughs> Uh, that'll be tricky. If we can use a graphing calculator, we can figure out if it's global or not. Not using graph calculators can be rough. I guess you take the limit. You can do it with limits, I guess. Okay. Yeah, no, we can do it without a calculator. Um... I'm being told to listen for a reason. We're just making sounds. Can to watch actual education soon? Let's get it. Okay, nice. Yeah, it's not going to be global. Yeah, I game over my Twitch channel. My subscribers are reduced, so I don't care. Okay, so... I'm, I'm debating if we want to... Let's get the second derivative, I think. It, this is a beast to do the quotient rule with. Unfortunately, it's what you gotta do. Um, it's getting towards the end of the day, I'm getting a little impatient, so I'm just gonna do the quotient rule, a lot of it mentally in my head. <laughs> if you need to me to explain it more, I can, but <laughs> this is a lot to write, and I'm just trying to reduce how much I'm gonna write. So we derive the numerator first. 6x minus 4, original denominator. Minus, now the original numerator. Times the derivative of the denominator. Oh god. Disgusting. Minus 5 over 2. Chain rule. 3x squared minus 4x. God. All of us over the original thing squared. Uh, 3 over 2 squared becomes a negative 3. Uh, hey, Zona man. Um, I, uh, you know you have to find the second derivative if they ask anything about inflection points. If they, if, if they say inflection or concavity, that's always the second derivative. Okay, so... What, this is going to be so annoying. Oh, gosh. 
So we have to set this equal to zero and solve for x. <laughs> and the same thing, we can do the same thing we did up here and just worry only about the numerator. The, the, the numerator isn't that nice though. So I'm rewriting the numerator here. I'm cleaning up a little bit. Really? They're making you solve this? That's so mean. <laughs> How do you even solve this for X? I might be possible to solve that for X. <laughs> Oh, you're Ronnie. Okay. Well, welcome in. It's incorrect? Okay. Are you guys the same person? Like, why are all three of you, or four of you, doing the same thing? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't get paid by, by YouTube. The requirements to get paid on YouTube are pretty high relative to the size of my channel. Um, similar minds? All right. Do answer the above questions. You're asking so many questions. I, I, I gotta do, do math sometimes. You, you can subscribe or not subscribe using whatever accounts you want. I'm wearing headphones because I'm listening to music. I, I, I don't play the music on, on YouTube. Uh, thanks for the follow, Zona. Wow, that's the functions. It's waving to you. Look at that. Why isn't it defined between one and whatever that number is? Or for negative numbers? Uh, this is a really mean problem. Are you sure there's not a typo in this? Scrolling up in chat right now. There's not a typo. Are you allowed to use a graphing calculator? In grade nine? Are you a genius? <laughs> this is a hard problem for a ninth grader. It's a hard problem for, for me and I majored in math. Young Sheldon. <laughs> oh, um. Did you go to Stanford? No, I didn't. Uh, 
Um, I, I gotta, I, I, I gotta be honest. I mind of uh, Windexes and Curtises. I don't. I, I'm not sure what to do with this one. I mean, that's pretty clean. Maybe I did ma make a mistake. In columns, my bad. Mohammed, you're you're being a little like extra right now. <laughs> like, it's like a million things. Oh, thanks for the the follow, Windex. <laughs> oh, smork. <laughs> Oh, we do get. Um, I guess we can do the same. We do get the, the negative powers. Like that's a negative power. That's a negative power. So we can do the same ignoring the denominator thing. We do have to get a common denominator, unfortunately. Um. So I'm I'm gonna do some more stuff mentally. <laughs> so we get a common denominator here and here. Uh, we have to do three six x minus four times just that to the power of one. Then this stuff will become a numerator without any changes. And then we don't need to worry about the denominator, but I'll just write it for fun here. So technically, now you can look at just the numerator instead of equal to zero. It's still, it's going to be a quartic. That's a little ridiculous. When you multiply it out. So I'm going to chop off the denominator because we... We don't need that. So you multiply those two out. I don't leave myself enough room for that multiplication now, of course. Uh, maybe I have just enough room. Minus 24x plus 16x squared. Wait. To the fourth. Cubed. All right. I think right. I'm Bam Baha. Oh god. Yeah, but Muhammad, I'm sorry, but like I, I I don't know what what to tell you. Squared. I'm combining like terms here now. Oh my god, dude. What, like, what is that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, 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 I can't do this by hand, man. I, I'm too tired. Um, oh, Lucas, I, 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 I thought I talked about that. I, I don't know how to do that one. I'm sorry. Um, rotating a function like that through an angle of 5 pi over 6. I don't know how that works, to be honest. Maybe it's, um, I'm not sure. 
See, I, uh, I, I have to call it quiz on the problem. I'm sorry. It's just the, the, the algebra is too hard for, for me. Um, I, 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 I would show you the technique to solve that problem, but that algebra is, it's, it's too much <laughs> for me right now, at least. Hey, Cosmolano. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'll copy the paste over the problem to Twitch chat here. I don't know if there's, um, I mean, you could, at the very least, ju just, just do the numerator trick and set the numerator equal to zero. Um, so like, I mean, that much we can do here. Minus 8x squared plus 18x. Like, you can do this with quadratic form of the roots. I'm doing it with Wolfram Alpha, but... So yeah, uh, these are your potential points of inflection, or your your points of inflection. Minus two, minus twelve. Oh, you're good. Oh, you get no points of inflection, and that makes sense because um, what was the original x cubed? Minus 2x squared plus 1 to the 1 third. Ooh! Look at that squiggly boy. Why does it look different from the Wolfram Alpha? Wolfram Alpha had no values between 1 and whatever this point is, and no values beyond there. Huh. So we should have points of inflection. Why not? Why don't we find any? Oh, I think this is what underscore was saying. Um, there's certain values you have to check manually. I don't know why though. Um, lots of mathematical beauty. Uh, I usually only find beauty in like applied things, I guess. Or like you have some complex situation that boils down to some nice equation. Um, I don't know. I, I it's not something I really think about much in the first place, to be honest. Uh, hmm. Uh, I would say beauty's in the eye of the beholder, like anything else. I guess. <laughs> I I I think it's it's. I guess to me, it's something that makes me go, "Wow, that's neat." I am gonna think it's something that's mathematically beautiful. Okay, right. I agree with the quadratic there. Um. Say, so yeah, I guess it's because what underscore is saying that we, you still have to check with the second derivative, but you don't end up getting anything from the second derivative. Why does it have vertical asymptotes in the first place, though? Why aren't you allowed to plug into a cubic that I'm not understanding? Because the cubics are fine, or like the cube root is fine with a negative number, right? One. One minus two plus one is zero. Cube root is zero. Is zero? Does zero make problems with the cube root? I wouldn't imagine it does. It's just zero. I don't I don't get why there's
I guess, yeah, the derivative definitely has asymptotes. Oh, that's right. If you do the chopping off the denominator part, you still need to check the zeros of the denominator because those are asymptotes and those could be... I get it. The original function doesn't have vertical asymptotes. But you could have points... Or, uh, I guess you want to have an extrema. Will you have an extrema? If you're... Actually, yeah, you might. You might have extrema and or points of inflection where the derivatives aren't defined. That's the mistake that I made. So yeah, you actually, I guess you need to set both the numerator and the denominator equal to zero. Uh, let's try it with the denominator and putting it into Wolfram. So let's set that thing equal to zero. Of course, Wolfram is going to do it for us. Uh, we have nine x cubed. Minus 2x squared plus 1 to the 5 over 2 equals 0. Um, yeah, according to Desmos, minus 0. 0.61, or minus, minus point, yeah. Is that the golden ratio? Should we move just close to, to it? I think it's 616 or something. So the zeros of the denominator speak of the devil. I think that is the golden ratio. That's where you get the three points of inflection from, from the denominator, where the second derivative isn't defined. Good call, underscore. <sighs> okay. So I'm not going to do the, the algebra involved here, but I can at least answer the question, which is, that's it. At, at, those are your points of inflection. Uh, we found potential extreme points at 0 and 4 over 3. Which are those two points. Uh, you can plug them into the original function. So, okay, the... Um, the issue, Sherlock, is the original function is defined at minus 0.618, 1, and 1.618. But the second derivative is not. Um, you get zeros there in the denominator. So you have to check those manually. Because... Um, the function, the original function, behaves weird at these points. It goes nearly vertical. And that messes with derivatives. Yeah, this is a nasty thing to give on a test. <laughs> um, so... It's on our test? Oh my god. That's really mean. I mean, if it's a problem that this hard, like, fi finding extreme points of inflection is the same thing to put on a test, but it's for a function like this, that's terrible. Um... <laughs> So yeah, I, I guess the, the lesson from this problem is if you get the denominator when you start deriving stuff, you need to check wherever the, wherever the derivative isn't defined. Um, put that into Desmos. Sure. Oh. Oh, thank you, Zona. <laughs> oh, that's a nice one. I want to save that. Um, 
Yeah, 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 that's possible. It's possible to solve this one, but I was I have trouble because it's not like that. Um... Like a procedural way, you have to think a lot more. But uh, thank you guys for the question for bearing with me. I always show the technique, even if I didn't do it right on my own, but... Um... Oh, say, Hey, thanks so much for the heart as well. Um... Gosh, okay, I it's been um, a really good day. Math. Um, I think I'm going to cut the YouTube stream off here. So if you're on YouTube, I appreciate you. I'll be streaming again tomorrow. Um, let's we'll look for someone to raid over on Twitch, though.